Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the four panellists this week who are going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back three of our regular players of the game. That's Paul Merton, Peter Jones, and Wendy Richard, and someone who's only playing the game for the second time, Lee Simpson. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> I miss it's Miriam Jones, who will keep the score and blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And, as always, I will ask the players to try and speak on the subject I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitating, repeating anything, or deviating from the subject on the card. Let us begin the show with Paul Merton. Paul, the subject is a great party. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? When we reach the end of this millennium and we wander into the next one, I imagine there'll be great parties all over the world. People will be celebrating with fruitcakes they have made specially for the occasion, <laughs> and they will be jumping and leaping with joy as we beckon ourselves towards that uncertain land called the future. What does it hold in store for us? Who can say? I remember once going to a spiritualist party where the uh, spiritualistic man... Uh, Lee Simpson. Well, I was enjoying it very much. It was a bit of hesitation. There, there. was a bit, a definite bit of hesitation there. So, Lee, you have a correct challenge. You get a point for that and you take over the subject, which is a great party and there are 26 seconds left starting now. The only great parties I ever went to was when I was a teenager. That was because snogging was the thing. You had a, one of those and you were away. The Watney's party pack was the lubricant for these events. You pop a hole in the top, drink the whole thing down and you were gone. Outside with Angela Clark possibly leaning her against the wall because she was too drunk and she'd fall down if you let her go. With your lip... Uh, Peter Jones, a chance. Well, that was a hesitation, I think. I yeah, think was, so, uh, yes. I he thought about Angela again. Clark and he really uh, dried up, didn't he? Um... <laughs> Two seconds, Peter, on a great party starting now. Well, on behalf of the political party, to which... <laughs> when the whistle goes, it tells us 60 seconds are up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Peter Jones. And, Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject, middle age. I don't know if there's anything deliberate in that thought, because I don't think you've yet you've reached it, Peter. But will you talk on the subject starting now? Yes, well, I suppose it is appropriate in a way because I am just about to emerge from the midlife crisis and uh, I'm looking forward to the twilight years <laughs> and uh, anything else that may follow, <laughs> including the next life, I suppose, <laughs> if there is one. I'm very doubtful about it, but nevertheless, a lot of people do seem to believe in it. The middle age, is it? Middle yes. age, yes. <laughs> well... <coughs> I don't know why it's called that, because it seems to be much younger than it was years ago. <laughs> People became middle-aged in the last century when they were about 35, which is nowadays considered fairly youthful. Whereas today there are people of 60 with dyed hair. The age has advanced and the Middle Age and presumably the Twilight Years are ah, even uh, later. Paul Merton Challenge. Repetition of Twilight. You had the oh, Twilight no. Years right at the beginning, Peter. That I did, yes, I yes. did, yes. 59 and a half oh. seconds. <laughs> oh. Oh. Shocking, isn't it? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Paul, you got in half a second on Middle Age starting now. Geoffrey Chaucer. <laughs> So Paul cleverly got in just before the whistle went and has taken the lead one ahead of Peter Jones. Lee Simpson, will you take the next round? The subject is putting one's foot in it. There are 60 seconds starting now. I saw that Caroline Quentin in a show. She was rubbish. That woman who was with Mrs Slocum, whatever happened to her? I thought Frank Muir was brilliant in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. These are three ways I might put my foot in it. The physical sensations that would follow that would be a sweaty patch at the bottom of my spine, which would travel quickly up to the back of my neck, over the top of my head, separate round my nose and... Paul Merton Challenge. A repetition, my. You're working in my, 
my, my, it was a bit too much. Yes. <laughs> 46 <laughs> seconds for putting one's foot in it, Paul, starting now. I've got this party dress at home and I love wearing it because you put it on and you have the one foot has to go in like that and then the other appendage at the end of your leg goes in there and you pull it up and it's quite tight and you walk down the street and suddenly you get noticed by the police and they come up and you say, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm just enjoying myself just like anybody else. Why shouldn't I? And they say, well, all right, mind your own business and off they go. But there's other ways of putting your foot in it, of course. I remember once my grandfather was doing, putting a concrete path outside the front door and he said, whatever you do, don't put your foot in this thing that I've just worked on here for the last 12 hours. And of course, that was the very thing I did because I'd stepped over the doorstep and I went plop right into the hard substance which he had been waiting to dry and I left a footprint in this particular thing that was there. Peter Jones, your challenge. A repetition of thing. And it couldn't have been a hard substance if it was already soft and he could his foot into it. <laughs> Seven seconds for the second challenge, not the first one, Peter. I'm putting one's foot in it starting now. We live very near the Royal Artillery Barracks, where there are 200 horses resident, and they exercise <laughs> outside in the street. I wonder what the smell was when you walked in, Peter. Right. Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject is driving. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? I can't drive, but my mother did attempt to teach me this particular skill when I was 16 years old. She had recently passed her driving test, and so she felt qualified to sit next to me in the car while I attempted to propel it forward. <laughs> Wendy Richard we had more than one attempt, didn't we? So, Wendy, you've got in with 47 seconds on driving, starting now. I am hopeless at driving. I failed my driving test six times. I had a tendency to wander over the other side of the road. I tried to tell the examiner it's because my godmother was French, but apparently this doesn't count. <laughs> I would like to be able to drive because I think it gives you a great sense of independence and it would save me taking so many taxi cabs. Not that I have anything against the gentlemen who drive these said vehicles because I find most of them charming and chatty, and I enjoy my conversations with them when I am travelling in their voitures. I would still... I I, I, what's a voiture? I don't know. Yes. I think, <laughs> I think it's a lovely word. I know, it's yes. a Step into my voiture. <laughs> I don't know if I should. Now, come on, in my voiture. <laughs> Yeah. You're working well tonight. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. And you have the subject. You have ten seconds. Driving, starting now. The last time I played golf was on the occasion of the marriage of Charles and Diana in 1981, I think. The most problematic part of the game for me was the driving. It's a ruddy, great, big wooden thing on the... <laughs> of that round. Peter Jones is still in the lead. Now he's equal with Paul Merton and then comes Lee Simpson, then Wendy Richard. Wendy, take the next round, please. The subject, the Channel Tunnel. Tell us something about that. Starting now. I don't think the Channel Tunnel is a very good idea, but I appear to be in the minority. I'm very concerned about all sorts of dreadful things that might happen. We hear of rabies and and. and <laughs> Hesitation. Yes, indeed. 48 seconds, starting now. I don't want to talk about the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> you better be quiet, then. <laughs> and you have the subject, Peter. 46 seconds, the Channel Tunnel, starting now. Well, I'm never going to travel through the Channel Tunnel because I should be denying myself the excitement of seeing France loom up over the waves, and that is one of the most exciting things one can have on a holiday, I think. Now, I've been several times by air, but it isn't quite the same, and going in the Channel Tunnel would be like approaching the continent in a submarine, just about as exciting as that. Ah. And I Lee Challenge. Too much exciting? Yes, yeah? you have. We said something would be exciting before. No, when I did, it went yes. On the, Got on the carried away. away. Yes. yes. <laughs> 20 seconds for the Channel Tunnel, starting now. The Channel Tunnel will be marvellous to ride on. You drive your voiture onto one of the cabins, <laughs> and it goes all the way there. You don't have to leave your voiture all the time you're on there. <laughs> Yes, well, Peter, you well, came he in did first. say what you twice, didn't he? Oh, he no. definitely said what you were twice. Mm. So, you... <laughs> Twelve seconds, uh, the Channel Tunnel, with you, Peter, starting now. It has cost an enormous amount of money, and I can't really see why they've done it. Because although it has created employment for a lot of people, and no doubt the... 
people in France. I've said that uh, twice. Mm, Paul Merton Jones. Repetition of people. Yes, Paul, you've got him with one second to go. Repetition of people. <laughs> I, I like you tonight. <laughs> what am I to do? I know. <laughs> one second, starting now. What you is <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you were speaking as well as when came the extra point. You're now in the lead, one ahead of Peter Jones. Peter, your turn to be, and the subject is Sophocles. Will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? Well, you obviously mean the great Greek playwright who flourished 500 years B.C. That's before Cable. And <laughs> uh, wrote plays. About a hundred of them, half a dozen, still exist and are performed but the others have vanished into the uh, past. Uh, he... Uh, <laughs> Simpson, you challenged. challenge. Yes, I did, yes. Uh, um, hesitation. hesitation. Yes, yes, yes hesitation. I'm afraid there was. 36 yes. seconds for you on Sophocles starting now. Sophocles, why? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, I could pretend, I could say I do, but frankly I don't. <laughs> Greek, Roman, no idea. Mm. Paul, 34 right. seconds. Sophocles, starting now. I had a cat once called Sophocles who enjoyed scratching his claws on the back garden shed. So I thought, well, I'm not having this. I don't see why these things that I go out and buy should be ruined by simple domestic animals. I don't see this particular creature bringing home a pay packet. Oh, no. So what I did was I killed it. <laughs> you challenged. Well, that does seem a bad example to set to the uh, younger listeners, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, it seems well, no, but, I mean, he's, he's deviated from Sophocles. He's talking about his cat, isn't he? Yes, and he's killed know, even but, that, but, let alone course, the subject. <laughs> Peter, you have a correct challenge in 11 seconds on Sophocles starting now. If Sophocles were alive today, he'd be writing for television and he'd probably be written out by now because he was so prolific. He had a competition with another Greek playwright, Aeschylus. <laughs> Peter Jones was then speaking as the whistle went and gained an extra point, of course, for doing so. He's in second place, one point behind Paul Merton, our leader, and Lee Simpson. Your turn to begin. The subject, Footlights. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Tony Slattery, Richard Vranch, Neil Malarkey, Moana Banks, Sandy Toxvig, Stephen Fry. The number of successful comedy performers who have emerged from the footlights over the years is almost too numerous to mention. This is a society at Cambridge University which seems intent on completely dominating the world of light entertainment. Why a learning institution on the banks of the CAM should produce such musing people and so rubbish rowers, I have no <laughs> idea. But perhaps what they should do is replace their team of moving the boat through the water people <laughs> with their footlights. Thereby, ah, just Peter Jones chant. Well, he did hesitate, I think. There. Yes, I think he did. It. 24 seconds for you. Peter, on Footlights, starting now. Yes, well, I always feel if I'd gone to Cambridge and joined the Footlights, my career would have been a more scintillating one even than it has been. And I think perhaps the period that I spent at this 10th-rate boarding school really damaged me emotionally in such a way that I shall never be able to shine like this man Slattery. By the way, I've been in America recently. It was so nice to be in a country where they'd never heard of him. <laughs> Peter Jones kept going to the whistle when gained an extra point. He's now taking the lead one ahead of Paul Merton. And, Wendy, it's your turn to begin. The subject is money. Will you tell us something about money in just a minute, starting now? I'm not very good with money. I do try to be and get my savings in order. But I sometimes have the great delight of finding odd bits of money, paper or coin, in various jackets or trousers that have been put away. Paul Merton Charles. This is stealing. <laughs> it's my own money. Oh, you didn't, you didn't establish that. You said you went round finding money in people's jackets and trousers. Oh, right. I found a £20 note in my trousers. Paul, we like the challenge. Give you a bonus point for that. So, Wendy, you were interrupted to get a point for that. 40 seconds on money, starting now. Well, it certainly wouldn't have been my husband's clothing because he always tells me he's never got any money. When it comes to emptying the washing machine, any money I find lying around in there, I always claim... Paul Merton, repetition of any. 
Yes, you did have any before. Paul, there are 29 seconds on money starting now. Money, money, money must be funny in a rich man's world. That was a song that ABBA recorded some 20 years ago and it seems that the subject of money has influenced the songwriting imagination over the years. The Beatles recorded several numbers about that sort of thing. I don't care too much for money. Can't buy me love. Uh, um, Peter Jones, shall uh, uh, Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. Uh, ten seconds, Peter. Money starting now. They always give you the value of the pound several times a day on the radio and television, explaining that it's gone up one-eighth of a tenic or something. And <laughs> Jones was again speaking as a whistle wind, gained that extra point, and he's now taken the lead once more. Lee Simpson, will you take the next round? The subject, Downs. Will you tell us something about Downs in just a minute, starting now? Clarissa rode out from the back garden of the country house. Her horse thrust its way through the Sussex Downs, her favourite place. It symbolised for her the freedom of her spirit, the depth of her feeling for the countryside around her. On the distance, she saw another horseman. He rode nearer. The braid on red showed him to be a soldier of some standing before she saw his face, which, when it got closer, she saw with lots of soaring. <laughs> A Paul Merton challenge. Shame. Oh, Repetition no, of saw. Yes. She was sawing too much then. She was. So, uh, Paul, you've got in on the subject of Downs. 39 seconds, starting now. I used to live near Epsom Downs, and one summer holiday I decided to dig a, dig a tunnel. <laughs> dig a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> Peter! Yes. He was going to dig a tunnel instead of dig a tunnel. Dig a, yes. Big a, yes, quite. He did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, Peter, you've got in with 25 seconds on Downs, starting now. Well, Downs happens to be the name of the newsagent who lived very close to us when I was born in this small town in Wem in Shropshire. And I used to go down to see Downs and buy magazines and newspapers. The Pigeon Fancier was one of my favourite uh, publications ah, because uh, I Merton kept Challenge. pigeon... What? Paul Merton Challenge, you, Peter. Well, this is deviation. Pigeon Fancier, what's going on? <laughs> Deviation from what? The normal sexual practices. Oh, I see. <laughs> right. So it was a devious thought, Paul, but he wasn't deviating from the subject of Downs, so he keeps the subject. And there are seven seconds left on Downs, Peter, starting now. They also sold cigarettes, and sometimes I was able to buy one at a time because they were in a little package, church room number one. <laughs> So Peter Jones kept going to the whistle wind once more and has increased his lead. Peter, will you take the next round? The subject is backhanders. Can you tell us something about those in this game starting now? Well, I suppose they're the alternative to forehand drives, aren't they, when people sweep the ball back over the net uh, from the, if they're right-handed, from the left-hand side. I don't know there's much left, really, to say about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Almost challenged. <laughs> Repetition of left. Yes, left. <laughs> yes, left. A few other things, too, but, mm. but Paul, 44 <laughs> seconds for backhanders starting now. Backhanders is a slang word for bribes, and I'd like to know who I have to pay to get off this show. <laughs> because I've been here now since 1988, and I don't know, I don't seem to really have got the grasp of it yet, even still. I've not really ever spoken for a minute without being interrupted. I've tried, but I've always ended up hesitating, deviating, or repeating myself. And it is an extremely difficult process to go through over the course of a full 60 seconds. <laughs> Peter Jones, a chance. Well, he isn't really talking about backhanders. Of course he's, he's he whinging. <laughs> <laughs> and he was certainly deviating from backhanders. You're right, Peter. So you have the subject back again. Fifteen seconds, backhanders, starting now. Yes, bribes. I've understood that there are people who give others money in order to get parts in films and plays and television. And I've never found out who these people are who are receptive to this kind of, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> uh, Paul Merton challenge. Hesitation. Yes, I'm afraid so. And you've got in again with two seconds oh, to go. Oh, they're going to hate me now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Backhand as Paul, starting now. I remember Peter Jones' challenge. Hesitation. Yes, well done, Peter. <laughs>
Well, I saw his mouth open and no sound came out for right, at least then. a split second. One second backhanders, Peter, starting now. They're evil. <laughs> Paul, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is animal rescue. Will you tell us something about it? 60 seconds, starting now. I can't bear cruelty to cats, especially if they're just going around their normal business. They don't know that it's a tool shed. They just want to scratch their claws and keep them pristine. And when some sad individuals get hold of these particular felines and start shooting them in the head with bullets which they've specially bought from the ironmongers, then I think that's very sad indeed. I once rescued a dolphin from the top deck of a double-decker bus who was hopelessly lost. He thought he was heading towards Piccadilly Circus, but I said, no, mate, you're on your way to Totteridge and Whetstone. He said, look, I don't normally live on land. I am an inhabitant of the sea. Can I be blamed for getting on the wrong bus? I said, don't get shirty with me, mate. It's nothing to do with anything I've just said to you. Go and have a word with the conductor. So the dolphin swam down the stairs and he went up to the man who was selling the tickets. He said, here, he said, I thought you said this was going to where I wanted to go. And the conductor said, look, I don't understand a word you're saying because I don't speak dolphin. (laughs) Suddenly, a porpoise... (laughs) Well, a moment ago, Paul Merton was whinging that he can't (laughs) keep going. He's never won a round. Uh, He kept going without being interrupted. No hesitation, repetition or deviation. Well, it was a few dolphins, let's face it. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, he not only gets a point for speaking when the whistle went, he gets a bonus point for not being interrupted. And at the end of that round, he's still in second place. (laughs) (laughs) Wendy, would you take the next round? The subject is my... My complaint. Oh, dear. That's why I dried, because I thought they might talk about my personal complaint. You take the subject any way you wish, Wendy. 60 seconds, starting now. My complaint at the moment is that I have a sore finger because I managed to slam it in the door. I've had five stitches in this digit, and it's extremely painful. Apart... Thank you for your sympathetic... (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, apart from that, I am... Usually you have no... Yes. I'm just watching. <laughs> I was so moved by this wave of sympathy oh, I got no. from the audience. That it was me. a wave of apathy. <laughs> <laughs> and you did repeat apart from that. I'm sorry, Wendy. Apart so, from that, yes. yes. Peter, yes. you have 39 seconds on my complaint, starting now. Well, uh, my complaint is really that uh, there are too many footling subjects brought up in this uh, game. <laughs> Why can't we discuss something really serious and go on for rather longer than a minute because that doesn't seem to give one a a chance to uh, stretch oneself (laughs) or uh, explore the various possibilities Uh, that are. You're a bit hesitating. Very hesitant, yes. Yes. Killing the show dead as well. (laughs) (laughs) After 28 years, Peter, complain about the subjects now. I mean... (laughs) Well, I didn't know. My complaint is with you, Lee. 21 seconds, starting now. My complaint, like many people, is a bad back. I sought solace for this with an osteopath. This is a gentleman or lady who cracks your bones. This is supposed to make you feel better. It makes me nauseous. (laughs) Peter Jones, a challenge. A good osteopath doesn't crack your bones. She cracks your joints. That's right. Cracks your bones. Well, you could sue. I wonder why you're so cheap. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder why you were sitting like that as well, Lee. Yes. (laughs) Peter, you've got the subject back again. 11 seconds. My complaint, starting now. The worst complaint I had was mumps when I was acting with Nicholas Parsons <laughs> on tour. And we went to Blackpool, and by the time we got to Nottingham, my chest had swollen up, and it had gone into my... Uh, <laughs> Peter Jones kept going till the whistle went, and that was quite true about the mumps. I've never seen a fellow's jaws look so large. He really was right out here. It was terrible. I said, keep and away. And that wasn't the only thing. No. <laughs> Peter, you've increased your lead at the end of that round, speaking as the whistle went. You're now ahead of Paul Merton still, and then it's Lee Simpson. Can't we stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, then it's your turn to begin, and keep going for 60 seconds, and you'll win in style. And the subject is plumbing... 
Yes. 60 seconds, starting now. Well, I've always thought that plumbing must be rather a lucrative profession, and I sometimes even wish that I'd taken it up, because I'd probably made a lot more money from it if I'd been able to do it properly. Of course, it's quite difficult. You have to learn about taps and pipes and cisterns and ball cocks and that sort of thing. But you don't have to arrive on time or even for several days <laughs> after you've <laughs> been called. And you can have an assistant. We had one uh, woman assistant, actually, <coughs> that I've said um, that before. Yes. Paul Merton Chance. Repetition of assistant. Yes, yes. Of assistant, that's right. Plumbing is with you, Paul, when the 30 seconds are left starting now. I think it was the Romans who are genuinely acknowledged to be the forefathers of plumbing. They had a <laughs> system of central heating, which I think first came in round about half past four one Wednesday afternoon, when <laughs> a gentleman suddenly had an idea. He thought, hello, this isn't right. I've got a fire against the wall when I could have pipes going under my floors, carrying hot water to a back boiler in the kitchen. And so I think his name was Sophocles. He decided that he would publish... The size. Well, that delightful, extravagant, surreal story kept Paul going until the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so. He's still three points behind our leader, Peter Jones, and this definitely is the last round, uh, <laughs> Peter. So, Lee Simpson, it's your turn to begin. Would you take the subject of a classical education? <laughs> 60 seconds, Lee, starting now. I've always felt at a great disadvantage not having had a classical education. They taught us practical things like how to join two pieces of wood together or how to care for your vole in the wintertime. <laughs> With a classical education, I could have shot for the stars. I could have aimed for the really high jobs like light entertainment at the BBC how I eventually found my way into the Cambridge Footlights with my classical education. Of course, in a classical education, one learns about Greeks and so on. Um, that's <laughs> it, really. That's all I know about it. Paul Merton Jones. There was delicitation, yeah. unfortunately. Yes, there was. The classical education is with you, Paul, and there are 35 seconds left starting now. I remember when I first heard the wonderful music of Beethoven. I thought, hello, this sounds good. And so I went down to the record library and immersed myself in all the wonderful works that this great... German composer had composed. There was his first symphony, his second concerto, his violin, what's it for piano, <laughs> which was not one of his most successful works because he didn't really come up with a good enough title for it. And even now, <laughs> pianists and conductors all over the world are very loath to put this into the classical programme because it's got such a strange sounding name. I. <laughs> Yes, so Paul Merton kept going to the whistle went and once again brought the show to a close in style. And as we've no more time, let me tell you that in third place, equal, were Wendy Richard and Lee Simpson. They were a few points behind Paul Merton, and that last flourish he did well but didn't quite catch up with Peter Jones. So, Peter, one point ahead. You are the winner this week. <laughs> It only remains me to say, on behalf of our four panellists, Peter Jones, Wendy Richard, Paul Merton, Lee Simpson, and Miriam Jones, who's been keeping the score blowing the whistle, and, of course, the creator of the game, Ian Messiter, and, of course, naturally, our producer, Sarah Smith, and myself, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed it all, and you'll be there once more when we take the air and play just a minute. Until then, from all of us, goodbye. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, 
My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once again, it's my pleasure to welcome the four interesting and talented personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back three regular players of the game, Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones, and Clement Freud, and we welcome someone who's only playing the game for the second time. That is Jenny Eclair. Would you please welcome all four of them? Beside me sits Jane Stevens, who's going to keep the score and blow a whistle when the 60 seconds is up. And this edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Ocean Room in the Spa Theatre Complex in the delightful seaside resort of Scarborough in North Yorkshire. And, as usual, I'm going to ask our four panellists to speak to me, if they can, on the subject that I will give them. And they will try and do that, as always, without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject on the card. And let us begin the show this week with Derek Nimmo. Derek, the subject is what I don't talk about. Can you talk on that subject in this game starting now? It's quite difficult to talk about that which I don't talk about, particularly as I was in MI8 and signed the Official Secrets Act, <laughs> which prevents me from talking about that which I don't want to talk about, when I was stationed in Cyprus at Number 9 Wireless Regiment. I had a particularly difficult time uh, just after the war, and I paid a considerable amount, I think, to my country's benefit and the King's service. Other things I don't talk about are Freemasonry, because I might have my tongue torn out by the roots and my body left at low watermark, which at Scarborough is particularly unpleasant. Clement the Freud is challenged. Hesitation. Yes, I agree. That sort of stumble there can be interpreted as a hesitation. So, Clement, you get a point for a correct challenge, and you take over the subject. There are 21 seconds left, and it's what I don't talk about starting now. What I don't talk about, because I was asked not to are Nicholas Parsons' problems. I accompanied the man when he saw his doctor about the problems which I'm not going to talk about. Peter Jones has challenged. A repetition of problems. Yeah, that's right. You can say that again. <laughs> I don't mind your audience laughing when they make jokes against me, but I don't think you should applaud as well. <laughs> Peter, I agree with your challenge, and you have the subject six seconds, and what I don't talk about starting now. I don't talk about lapses of taste or indiscretions of my friends, nor do I tell them... <laughs> Clement Freud, will you take the next round? Going to the dogs. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Going to the dogs is usually used disparagingly, meaning someone is past it, is doing bad things. I would like to mention that going to the dogs is an extremely attractive, sometimes lucrative, and often wonderful pastime. Greyhounds run in tracks at all... Jenny Eclair's He hesitated quite badly, I feel. I think hesitation is enough. Yes. <laughs> Jenny, I agree with your challenge. So you get the subject oh. and you start now. This country is going to the dogs. That's because they're taking over, messing up our streets. In fact, where I live, you don't walk, you skid along, bumping into <laughs> lampposts and breaking your hips. And I don't agree with Clement about going to the dogs is a nice thing to do because you look at those poor, wafy things and you look in their eyes and they're saying, please give me a meat and potato pie, I'm starving. Uh, uh, Peter Jones challenge. Some kind of uh, hesitation. Some kind of yes. hesitation, yes. 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 So, Jenny, as you've played the game before once, I have to be... A, a you have to more... be brutal. No, 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 I just have to be firm and, and right. fair to the others. Fine. And 16 seconds are with Peter now to tell us something about going to the dogs, starting now. Before I was married, I used to go to the dogs and have a few bets, but I don't anymore because I really can't afford it, frankly. <laughs> I'm saving up for a knighthood. And I... <laughs> <laughs> All the money... I have to that end. Now, going to the dogs can involve a certain amount of mixing with... Un <laughs> well, Peter Jones again was speaking as a whistle wind, gained another point for doing so, and he's in a strong lead at the end of that round. And, Peter, it's your turn to begin the subject, being misquoted. Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, that's something that really nobody likes. 
For instance, I once made a remark to somebody and I was quoted as saying that I wished somebody or other was dead. Jenny or Claire Chance. You said somebody twice. Yes, I yes, did. Jenny. I didn't want to mention their name, you see, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jenny, you got in with the correct challenge again and 50 seconds to tell us about being misquoted starting now. I think I've been misquoted once in a magazine article that said I was married as if. Um... <laughs> Uh, Clement Freud challenge you. Hesitation. Yes. yes, she thought about being married and came to Because I'm stop. not. I wonder why. <laughs> so <What> do I. <laughs> Clement, you have 44 seconds on being misquoted starting now. I shot a hippopotamus with bullets made of platinum because if I used leaden ones, I would lose a fortnight's holiday in Merthyr Tidful. This is a direct <laughs> misquotation of Ogden Nash, who finished his verse... My hide be bound to flatten them. I thought I'd mention this. <laughs> I have been misquoted. Peter Jones, a child. That was a hesitation. No, it wasn't. Peter. Well, it was a pause. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I thought he kept going quite well in spite of the audience's response. Clement, I disagree with the challenge. You have a point and 24 seconds on being misquoted starting now. I have never been misquoted in a long and serviceable political career. Everything that newspapers have said about me have been completely, utterly, frankly true. And I'm sorry about this. The only way to go about it is to lead as publicly disreputable a life <laughs> as you can and hope that your family will sit with the consequences. <laughs> so Clement kept going and gained that extra point in his equal Peter Jones in the lead at the end of that round. Jenny Eclair, it's your turn to begin. The subject, how to make a million. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? The easiest way to make a million pounds is to marry a very rich old man and then wait for him to fall down the stairs. Peter Jones a challenge. Not much use to me. <laughs> we enjoy the challenge, Peter, so we give you a bonus point for that, but as it was an incorrect challenge, yes. uh, Jenny gets a point for being interrupted, keeps the subject, 54 seconds, how to make a million starting now. Unfortunately, I don't have the attributions for a trophy bride. I haven't got thin brown thighs and big hair and silicone breasts, so unfortunately I'm going to have to make it myself. Uh, I just want to do if that Nemo was... challenge. Too yes. unfortunate. There were two unfortunate. That's my life. It's unfortunate. It's just unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so amused by that, Peter? <laughs> I think she's very funny. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I will marry that man. <laughs> But he hasn't got a million, I'm sorry. He hasn't Derek. got one. Derek, I agree with your challenge. And there uh, are 44 seconds for you to tell us something about how to make a million starting now. Probably one of the best ways to make a million is to start growing fruit in northern Cyprus and export it through Kyrena to England. And then get to uh, uh, Clement Foyle's challenge. Was that repetition of fruit? No, it sounded I don't think like fruit. No, he didn't say he was ah, I'm sorry. Eat, said, Give him a point. Fruit, Give him several points. So, 35 seconds for you, Derek, on how to make a million starting now. Alternatively, I might have a dinner at the China Club in Hong Kong and get along an assorted number of Chinese businessmen and ask them if they chip in to a fund to give me a million. This would be enormously beneficial, particularly if Michael Heseltine would come and open that said place the following week. Then I would bring all the monies back to the United Kingdom, put them into the stock exchange. Perhaps there would be two million by then, and I'm sure at the end of a week... I would make a million. Peter Jones, a challenge. Repetition of week. Yes, it was. You said week before. There are five seconds for Peter on how to make a million starting now. If you're talking about lira, it's quite easy because you exchange it for about £100 or so. <laughs> Peter Jones was again speaking as the whistle went and he has increased his lead at the end of that round. And Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is ghosts. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? At the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough, 
on a Friday night, the ghost walks. That is a theatrical expression, meaning that you're going to be paid. And all the company, run by Mr. Alan Akeborn, so splendidly welcome that particular ghost. Now, sitting here, I feel I'm surrounded by the ghost of the wonderful Max Jaffa. How often I used to listen to him through my whole life, practically, playing his violin, and I wish I could stand there and sing and play selections from the Bell of New York and Maid of the Mountains, for is is a very tuneful ghost. <laughs> Jenny Eclair, you've challenged. He said is eight times. <laughs> Well, he may have done, but he also hesitated, didn't he? Yes. So, Jenny, you have a correct challenge, and you have 21 seconds to tell us something about ghosts starting now. It's very easy if you're going to a fancy dress party to dress up as a ghost, because all you need is a sheet over your head, and then you go, ooh, and frighten people a lot. Clement Freud challenge. We have to go. Yes, go to a fancy dress you go party, to a party go. and you go, ooh, but bad luck, Jenny. 12 seconds for <laughs> Clement on ghosts Sorry. starting now. The only Clement ghosts I know are Mr. and Mrs. Simon de Vere, who live at 187 Balham High Street, London, SW16. I thought I'd just mention them. Peter Jones, a challenge. If they live there, they can't <laughs> be ghosts. <laughs> I understood that was their surname. They didn't live there as ghosts. I thought that was the point he was making. So, actually... <laughs> So that we, was the point? Yes, I thought that was the point. Wasn't that the point you were making? Oh, well. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Peter, you have a point for an amusing challenge. And two seconds on ghost starting now. Is a six-letter word with a vowel. <laughs> in spite of Clement getting points in that round, uh, Peter Jones is still in the lead. One ahead of him, and Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is dressing. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? In the United States, what we call stuffing is dressing. Herbs, bread, seasoning, spices, liquor, anything at all which you put inside a bird and odiously take out when no one is looking. <laughs> what you stuff in a partridge, a pheasant, a chicken, a turkey, even a tortoise, is called dressing. <laughs> we tend to use the word dressing for salads, using oil and vinegar with salt and pepper, and push the dressing over anything that blushes or wilts as a consequence of the application. <laughs> dressing is also used for putting on clothes, shoes, socks, pants, trousers, <laughs> shirts, ties, jackets, waistcoats, and dressing up doesn't mean that you're doing it in order to impress people with the brilliance of your wardrobe, but dressing in that direction is simply making you smarter. Peter Jones has challenged. He said stuff twice earlier on. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I deliberately said stuffing stuffed you and said stuffed. that as well, yes. No, no he I... did. He did say stuffing stuffed and stuffed. No, it's... Oh. I have to be fair to everyone. And he keeps going for four seconds on dressing, starting now. Cross-dressing means wearing the clothes... <laughs> and Clement kept going and got an extra point for speaking as the whistle went, and he's now one point ahead of our previous leader, Peter Jones. Uh, Peter, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is Fiji. Will you tell us something about that place starting now? Well, it's not just one island. It's uh, about a thousand of them all together in the South Pacific. And I think they invented salad dressing. Uh, uh, <laughs> Terry never challenge. Hesitate. Yes, he did hesitate. <laughs> I'm just pondering the idea of them inventing salad dressing. I think it's a rather lovely Thousand idea. Thousand Island, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Peter. Give him another bonus point. I like that one, yes. <laughs> but Derek has the subject, and this is Fiji, 51 seconds, starting now. I remember the first time that I landed in Suva, which is the capital of Fiji. I went to my hotel, wrote up my name, and as they haven't got any television there, they said, we listened to just a minute. But it was quite a surprise when you go to a place that you've never been to before. An uncle of mine was Chief Justice at the time, 
very difficult task. Was any clear chance? Did he say flunkle instead of uncle? <laughs> I said, I don't have any flunkles, I only have uncles. <laughs> I, I don't mind. It's very difficult sometimes with Derek's sort of what he claims is impediment, but I think it's his way of clambering <laughs> out of it. It's cheating. Uh, yes. Uh, Jenny, as you've only played the game once before, I'm going to be very generous and say uh, you have the subject and 34 seconds on Fiji starting now. I've got absolutely nothing to say about Fiji. I've never been there Derek, in my life. Derek, you've challenged. Deviation's got nothing to say about Fiji. Oh, okay. <laughs> So Derek's got the subject back because you were deviating. <laughs> and there are 31 seconds on Fiji starting now. The principal problem in administrating the Republic is that 48% of the population are, in fact, Indian, and a rather smaller number are Fijian or Macronesian by descent, which means that the Fijians are very big butch fellows that can kick the other fellows around, particularly in the rugby sevens in Hong Kong, I might tell you. That they, uh, you did say fellows twice. Yes, that's right, yes. Don't look so surprised. You said fellows twice. All oh, right, I'm not All right. Complaining. They try and bluff me out a bit, you see. Uh, Jenny, you had a correct challenge there, and you've got nine seconds on the subject you don't want to talk about. Uh, Fiji starting now. Oh, I'd love to go to my hairdresser, and when she said, where are you going on your holidays this year, I'd like to turn around and say, Fiji, I always go to Fiji. Derek, no more chance. Oh. No, no, absolutely wrong. I'm very unsporting. I know. It wasn't a fair challenge. I withdraw it absolutely, <laughs> and I think she's the most charming girl we've ever had in the <laughs> And if I had a million pounds, I'd propose so if I hadn't got a wife already. <laughs> you can't get round me or her in that way. Are you allowed to repeat the subject on the card, which is Fiji, and that's what she did? So you get a point, Jenny, for being interrupted, and you keep going for one second, and you'll probably get another one in a moment. It's still Fiji, starting now. Lots of beautiful women. <laughs> Jenny Clare, our second time player of the game. She's moved rapidly forward and she's only one point behind our joint leaders which is Peter Jones and Clement Freud and for once Derek Nemo is training a little. Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is now socks. Will you tell us something about that in 60 seconds starting now? Well, socks is a very appropriate subject for me at the moment because I've really got to pull my socks up if I'm going to retrieve anything from this absolutely disaster performance that I'm giving today in just a minute. Socks, I like wearing them very much indeed. Sometimes I wear odd ones it's terribly good fun. You can have a red one and a pink one, a green one and a blue one, a white one and a black one and a brown one, and so on. Uh, Jenny, you shan't. He said one a million times. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Once we might let her get away with it, twice no, and uh, four or five times, definitely not. <coughs> Jenny, socks, 40 have, seconds, starting now. I have terrible problems with my socks, you know, because I've got moths in my wardrobe. Can you believe this? I'm so distressed. What can one do? You have to put down mothballs. I keep saying moth. God, I'm so dreary. I do <laughs> apologise. <laughs> But it is a recent thing, and I'm, I, um, I'm distraught. Jenny, Jenny, you have been challenged, actually. But I would like people to write in and tell me what to do about my problem with moths. <laughs> yes, they smell, those mothballs. You smell like a little old lady. <laughs> I like it. Oh, call her Camphor Eclair soon. Um, yes. <laughs> Derek, you challenged, and you have 30 seconds on socks starting now. Before the invention of nylon socks, when one wore socks of pure wool, then if they developed a hole, you darned them, and one used to have nice little things shaped rather like a mushroom. <laughs> it used to bung up the sock and then draw threads across it into a kind of like a crisscross situation, and then the wool was put over it, and then your sock would be good as new once more. And when there was clothes rationing, which not many of you, apart from Peter Jones and Clement Foy, can remember... Derek Nemo did get a number of points in that round, including one for speaking as the whistle went. He's moved forward, but he's still in fourth place, which is unusual. <laughs> Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Jenny Clare are all equal in the lead. And Peter, it's your turn to begin. And the subject now is what I'd love to do right here in Scarborough, in front of this audience. Let's discover what it might be, starting now. I'd love to be able to speak for a minute without deviating, hesitating, or anything else, like being obscene or uh, politically incorrect. <laughs> Derek, no more challenge. Five oars. Yes, oars, as well as the hesitation, so... Uh... Oh, as well, yes. <laughs> yes. Derek! <laughs> you, 
<laughs> the subject. And it is what I'd love to do right here. 50 seconds starting now. What I'd love to do right here is to have behind me a really big band like Ted Heath had in the old days. And I would inflict upon you all my version of my way, which would ring out across the... Jenny Eclair, Charlie. My, my. Yes, my, my, my. <laughs> what have these people done to you, Derek? <laughs> Jenny, 37 seconds are left. The subject is what I'd love to do right here, and you start now. What I'd like to do right here would be to have liposuction, because I saw my bottom in the mirror in the hotel, and I was so distressed, I thought, that's what I need, someone to suck the fat out of it. Then I'd like to leap into a jacuzzi with a big magnum of champagne and all my mates, and then mm. I oh. would... Kevin Floyd challenged. I, I was just helping her out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm grateful... Do you mean by that it was the offer of the jacuzzi? Hesitation. I was just kind of trying to keep things clean, you know. Mm. What's all this liposuction? I don't know what it is. What is liposuction? I'll explain later. <laughs> with your figure, Derek, you don't actually need it, so I wouldn't worry. Clement, I agree with the hesitation. 19 seconds on what I'd love to do right here, starting now. What I'd love to do right here is walk down the promenade, making a various number of stops for prawns, mussels, Lobsters and the excellent dress crab for which Scarborough is rightly famous. North Yorkshire, of all the counties in England. <laughs> God, he's a creep, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> creep. Get an extra point for being a creep. No, no, yes. Clement, you managed to keep going with creeping up with your sycophancy until the whistle went, so you get an extra point for doing that, and you've taken the lead, one ahead of Jenny Eclair, two ahead of Peter Jones, three ahead of uh, Derek Nimmo, and Jenny, it is your turn to begin, and the subject is, at the end of the day. Would you tell us something about that subject, starting now? At the end of the day, I like to sit on my sofa, slobbing around, surrounded by bottles of wine, cigarette packets, watching one of those dreary old sitcom things that make me laugh so much. Then I know I should take my makeup off, because otherwise I'm going to have skin like a pterodactyl. But unfortunately, I'm a bit of a sad old slapper, and I go to bed, and it's all over my pillow, mascara, lipstick, dribble, because that's what I do at the end of the day, lots of dribbling. And another I have to, I'd like to be able to slip into clean cotton sheets, Irish linen, but unfortunately I have to roll back a rather smelly old duvet, which is full of biscuit crumbs and my rather flatulent four-year-old daughter, and I have to turf her out and get her into her own bed. Then I get into the bed and I like to kiss my partner goodnight, and he goes, yeah, why don't you go and clean your teeth? Um, Peter Jones at charge. Uh, hesitation. I don't <laughs> think she hesitated I'm talking for a nonsense moment. for too long. She didn't hesitate. What was it? <laughs> it was a rather disgusting picture that she painted, actually. Yes, but I was doing her a service professionally. <laughs> I would agree with you there, yes. But, uh, Jenny, an incorrect challenge. You have um, 13 seconds, and it's the end of the day starting now. I'd make myself some hot milk and have a little biscuit and... What else did I do? Oh, no yes, idea. Derek Nimmo challenge. Well, we have the biscuits all yes, day. Yeah, yeah. 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 The biscuits were in your bed before and now you're going to yeah, have biscuits. Yeah. And so, uh, Derek, you had a correct challenge. You have eight seconds to tell us at the end of the day, starting now. At the end of the day, I like to slip into my green velvet smoking jacket, undo a bottle of Krug champagne, take two glasses out of the studio. So Derek Nimmo was speaking as a whistle when gain an extra point for doing so as we move into the last round and it's Derek's turn to begin and the subject is the Loch Ness Monster. Derek, you have 60 seconds on the Loch Ness Monster. No, not literally, I mean, but to talk on the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Starting now. Whenever I go to look for, or indeed at, the Loch Ness Monster, I fly to Inverness, drive across the Black Isle, and down to Drumna Drocket, where the Loch Ness Monster Museum happens to be. And I can take some snaps within that particular establishment and pretend to my chums that I actually have witnessed old Nessie. 
gosh, it would be a wonderful excitement, would it not, if the Loch Ness Monster actually lived. How exciting, charming, and a better world it might be. with full of sword and poly pecks and things like that. I would like a real Loch Ness Monster on which to ride, perhaps, or photograph it down at the bottom of the loch. Uh, Jenny Eclair has challenged. Photograph twice. Am I making that up? <laughs> well, I don't know, just wandering on. I'm enjoying the lovely sun. He said actually four times. Yes. But you didn't challenge for it, Clement. Oh, no. no. Right. right. <laughs> so, Jenny, you have 18 seconds to tell us something about the Loch Ness Monster starting now. When people say they've seen the Loch Ness Monster, I sneer in my cynical fashion, going, get out of it, because these are the same folk who've seen Lord Lucan, Elvis Presley, and Shergar playing cards together. Mind you, <laughs> I would not like to count out on the shores of that lagoon in case some dread creature reared its ugly head. Uh, there is like... a challenge. Well, it's not a lagoon, it's a loch. <laughs> it, it, it is a loch, and that is the Scottish word for it, but uh, some people might refer to it as a lagoon. I don't see why the they should. lagoon is generally surrounded by a coral reef, actually. If you go to Fiji, you'll see one. This... <laughs> you never hear the lagoon ness monster, do you? <laughs> so much, I'll just give it. I've <laughs> heard Americans refer to Loch Ness as a lagoon, so people do refer to it incorrectly. You are a liar. You really are. <laughs> no wonder I dislike you so much. I mean, Americans <laughs> refer to Loch Ness that, as Derek, a lagoon. Derek, let's get this really right. Nicholas. It was in a show that was recorded a few weeks back you decided you didn't like me. I've always disliked you. Oh. It matter which <laughs> week we're talking about. <laughs> Whether you like me or not, I still have to play just a minute and anyway, I don't believe you, because I think you say most outrageous things in order to get laughs. I can't remember what we're talking about now, by the way, but... I, I can tell time. you, Jenny, that you have another point for that, and you are now just in the lead. There's one second left. You're one ahead of our previous leader. The subject is the Loch Ness Monster. One second, starting... Now, the Loch Ness Monster is very good. Jerry, what was your challenge? Is it very good? Yes, indeed, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Half a second on the Loch Ness Monster starting now. The Loch Ness Jenny, Monster is a very, very... Absolutely, Jenny, you're perfectly correct, <laughs> yes. A quarter of a second, the Loch Ness Monster starting now. The Loch Ness now. Monster is a... Yes, yes. <laughs> So we finish just a minute with a flourish. First of all, we thank our lovely audience of Scarborough for welcoming us so well and making our stay here so enjoyable. Before I give you the final score and say, uh, Peter Jones, who usually does extremely well and hasn't failed us once again, he finished in fourth place, but he got a lot of points. <laughs> he was only one point behind Derek Nimmo, who was only one point behind Clement Freud, but they were, all of them, three or four points behind our winner, who's only played the game once before, Jenny Eclair. She's our winner this week. <laughs> we do hope that you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only remains for me to thank our four delightful panellists for the contribution they made to make the show so successful, and that is Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo, and Jenny Eclair. And also, I thank James Stevens for keeping the score so well and blowing her whistle so magnificently when 60 seconds are up. I thank you, Mr., for thinking of the game so we all keep working. We thank Sarah Smith, who directs the show and makes sure that we all keep in order. <laughs> and that is, of course, my job. This is Nicholas Parsons saying goodbye. I hope you've enjoyed it and be with us next time you play Just a Minute. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my
my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome the four distinctive personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. Paul Merton, Derek Nimmo and Clement Freud, and Eddie Izzard. <laughs> Beside me sits Miriam Jones, who keeps the score and also blows a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. This particular recording of Just a Minute is coming from Edinburgh during the festival. As usual, I will ask our panellists to speak on the subject I give them. They will try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviating from the subject. Let us begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject that Ian Messer has thought of is Edwin, King of Northumbria. Would you talk uh, that subject, if you can, in just a minute, starting now? There is a school of thought that has it that dyslexia caused this non sequitur. Uh, Eddie is our challenge immediately. Yes. Was that a hesitation? Or... I thought there was a hesitation, yes. And, you look uh, a bit pissed uh, off, Clement. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, Eddie, you, um, you've obviously learned from your first time and you're very sharp and keen and uh, you've got in with only six seconds gone. You get a point for a correct challenge. 54 seconds are left. Edwin, King of Northumbria, starting now. Edwin, King of Northumbria, was a large man, over nine foot tall. He lived in a tree and often played banjo on Tuesdays. <laughs> but mainly Northumbria was his place. He liked to hang out there and run around and be king, because he was King Edwin of Northumbria. <laughs> and he used to bowl... <laughs> Uh, okay. Derek Nimmo challenge. He used, he used the word used. Yes, he, so he used more than once. So um, Derek's got in with a correct challenge. 36 seconds are left, uh, Derek. Edwin, King of Northumbria, starting now. He is, of course, the king after which Edinburgh is named. Although more precisely, in New Zealand, they call it Dunedin, because that is the Gaelic pronunciation. He was an extraordinary man, born in Wales, and then became a great conqueror throughout the whole of Britain. Not only did he take Scotland, but he took everywhere except Kent, and he was converted to Christianity. What uh, now? Paul Who was Chuck. doing that? There's that? a bit of sloppy dialect there, wasn't yeah. there? <laughs> We kind of sort of sidled towards a few vowels and it all went yeah. a bit wrong. So really. what is your challenge? A deviation. Deviation? From what? The English language. English language. Yeah. <laughs> the English language as she is spoke. All right, uh, Paul, I agree with your challenge and you have a point for a correct challenge, of course, and there are 18 seconds left for you to tell us something about Edwin, King of Northumbria, starting now. Edwin was, in fact, ten feet tall if he stood on a one-foot-high stool. <laughs> and he did an awful lot of this because he liked... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of foot. <laughs> ten foot. <laughs> yes. He stood on a one-foot stool and he was ten foot tall. Well, you'll listen to me. <laughs> very mean, isn't it? <laughs> he let you go for a bit. I just was wondering about it. I just had to do a quick recall, you know. I just sort of run the tape back in my mind, and then it came you've back. Got a, you've got a tape running in your mind. <laughs> in this, on the basis that all our minds are rather like superior computers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Clement, you have a correct challenge. Ten seconds. Edwin, King of Northumbria, starting now. Was actually called Wendy, Queen of Northumbria, <laughs> and Edinburgh was called Wensbury. All this nonsense about royalty... Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point, and it was Clement Freud, so naturally he's in the lead at the end of that round. Derek Nimmo, will you take the next round? The subject is shorts. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. There's nothing nicer, I think, in Edinburgh than wandering around in shorts to a two chap sitting on the front row wearing those very garments. I would like to wear them myself, but the weather was rather inclement when I started this morning. That's got nothing to do with Freud talking about the temperature. But when I wear shorts, I do have rather skinny legs, and perhaps it is a good idea to keep trying uh, to. Clement Freud, Charles. Deviation. Why? Well, even if he doesn't wear shorts, he has skinny legs. <laughs> Uh, the very, circumference of a part of a body is absolutely is, irrelevant is. to it's the It's a very clever environment. interpretation of deviation, which we grant you, Clement, and you get a point for that. And 41 seconds to tell us something about shorts, starting now. My favourite playbill is from the Southwell Cinema before the war, and it said, The Seventh Veil with Shorts. I've always been awfully fond of that. I... <laughs> 
upon that more than the audience. A hesitation. Yes, he was so fond of it, he waited and nothing happened. And, um, Paul, you have a correct challenge. 29 seconds, shorts, starting now. In the 1930s, Laurel and Hardy became immensely popular because they were made a short film once a month for 12 months of the year. <laughs> and Derek Nimmo challenge. Months. No, the other one was months. One, once a month, and the other one was months. Sorry, Derek, well tried, but incorrect challenge. Paul has another point. And there are 20 seconds, shorts, Paul, starting now. They won an Academy Award for one of these movies. It was called The Music Box. It consisted of the two of them trying to move a piano up a huge flight of stairs. The end joke at the right at the end... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a tough game, isn't it? Derek, you got in first, yes. My hesitation on double end. Uh, uh, yes, two ends. Two ends. Uh, yeah. Seven seconds, Derek. Shorts, starting now. I went into a bar in Rose Street and asked for some shorts. I wanted a whiskey and a gin. The barmaid was frightfully <laughs> helpful and kind oh. to me. Eddie, and apparently Eddie just before, before the whistle. Oh, I'm sorry. There was, I just thought two bars there. Yes, there were. I went to the bar. Barmaid. 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 No, barmaid. I take that back. And you take that you back. Win. All right. Extra point. <laughs> <laughs> Extra point for wrong challenge. All right, then. Extra point for wrong challenge. And a, a point for <laughs> speaking when the whistle went. So we give him a round of applause. And Derek Nemo's in the lead at the end of that round. Paul Merton, will you take the next round? The subject, Bugs. Can you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Bugs Bunny became very popular with a series of short films during the 1940s. Particularly one end joke right at the finale of one of his movies was a marvellous example of the visual sight gag at its finest. Bugs was walking down... <coughs> Clement Fry challenge. I'm sorry. Um... I'd forgotten that Bugs was... Bugs the, is on. Yep. Yes, you can repeat the subject in the car. Apologies. You've only been playing the game for 26 years, Clement, but it's, uh, <laughs> it is very difficult sometimes. But, um, uh, but because you interrupted him, Paul gets a point for that and continues with 43 seconds, Bugs starting now. When I was working in Australia some five years ago, I was plagued by a particular mosquito that used to get into my bed every night and bite the hell out of me. I would wake up every morning and saw this huge bloated thing in the corner of the room filled up with my blood, Mark, you. <laughs> Derek Nimmo challenge. There's no blood. Yes, you, you had a lot of blood taken from him. Derek, it's your turn to begin. 25 seconds, bugs are starting now. King Edward of Northumbria was actually smitten down by the most awful bug which he acquired when passing through North Wales on Tuesday, the 15th of April, 1632. <laughs> Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Uh, that wasn't a Tuesday, that was a Thursday. <laughs> were, you, were you around? No, no, I just know, I just, I just one of my hobbies. <laughs> I, through the centuries, I know what day followed on what day. 16th of April, then about that time, was a Thursday. How do I judge on that? <laughs> well, why don't you run the little computer that's your brain? <laughs> It hasn't been programmed as far back as 1632. No points are allowed, and uh, Derek keeps the subject. 13 seconds left, bugs starting now. I must say that uh, Paul Merton... Uh, really Paul Merton challenge. Him. There was a hesitation. There, there. was a hesitation. <laughs> 11 seconds for you, Paul, on Bugs, starting now. One of the criminals who made an awful lot of money in the 1920s was called Bugsy Moran. He was a terrible fellow. He rivalled Al Capone and all those other crooks that grew... Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went, and he gained an extra point for doing so. He's now equal in the lead with Derek Nimmo. Eddie Izzard, your turn to begin. The subject, haggis. Will you tell us something about that Scottish delicacy in this game starting now? Haggis is a type of seabird that lives in Kent. It often plays banjo in trees, but very rarely is eaten as a Scottish delicacy, uh, including things that sheep go... Yes, Mrs. And... Um, <laughs> My brain caved Derek in, Nimmo sorry about challenged. that. Well, he's sort of gone, hasn't he? Yes, really? I <laughs> You brought him out of his world of fantasy back to Earth. I think, uh, yes, he'd gone. Hesitation. 47 seconds on the subject of haggis, Derek, haggis starting... Haggis is quite rightly called the great chieftain of the pudding race. There is no finer... Uh, Paul Merton Deviation, challenge. I've never heard haggis called the great chieftain <laughs> of the pudding race. Yes, Robbie Burns. Is it true? 
With one simple slip, I've turned the entire audience against me. <laughs> so is yes. the strawberry fool like the Prince Regent or something? <laughs> Rabbi Barnes wrote a whole poem to young chieftain of the pudding race. I said, Chapir of Hodia had a horn upon the satitude. <laughs> that Eddie. was just, I was just challenging that. Um, <laughs> generally. No, that, that was Doric Scott's gibberish. Oh, yeah. um, so, um, Paul, I'm very sorry, Derek was right. He keeps the subject. 40, and a point, of course. 42 seconds on Haggis starting now. Heart, lungs, liver mixed together with suet and oatmeal, and all put into the belly of a sheep. Very <laughs> extra... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. It's the pluck of a sheep. The pluck? Well, I thought it was a stomach. Is a stomach a pluck as well? Mm. <laughs> Is a stomach a pluck? Yes. But, but I suppose the, but the stomach comes from the belly of the sheep. No, I think, I think you're, you are correct, Clement. I give Why? you the benefit of the doubt. Why? <laughs> well, the belly of an animal is the whole of his... It's the whole body of him is his belly, isn't it? It's not just the, 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 the stomach. It seems that this audience is an entire expert on haggis. Everyone is... <laughs> I have think got... they should have this subject and yes. we should challenge them. Yeah. I think... <laughs> Let them decide. If you agree with Clement Freud's uh, challenge, you cheer for Clement, and if you disagree, you boo for Derek Nimmo, and you all do it together now. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Even the Scots are divided amongst themselves. <laughs> All right, uh, Derek, what we do is we call it a draw. No point scored. You keep the subject. Haggis, 33 seconds, starting now. I once went to a burn supper in Kuwait, and the local chieftain was called El Jog. He was a shape of... Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of chieftain. Yes, great chieftain of the pudding oh, race. Oh, well, listen, well done. <laughs> So Paul's got in with his chieftain. 30 seconds on Haggis, Paul, starting now. I like Haggis quite a lot, and I eat it whenever I'm up here. There's a butcher near where I live, back in London, who also specialises in Haggis, and it's a wonderful dish. If you, I like giving it to people who don't know what's in it, because they say, oh, that's lovely, and then you tell them, they go, ooh, and you say, well, no, it was quite nice, you enjoyed it. They say, well, I suppose, in retrospect, I did. But if you'd given me the ingredients beforehand, I might have hesitated before I'd put my fork into this particular chieftain of all puddings. <laughs> I believe that... Um, <laughs> Derek never challenged. Um, hesitation. Oh, he was going with such style. I think that was a bit, a bit sharp, yes. No, I'm going to give Paul the benefit of the doubt on this one and say, you have three seconds to go on Haggis, Paul, starting now. The undoubted thing about Haggis. Uh, Clement Freud Chan. We've had a thing before. Yes, you did have a thing before. <laughs> yeah. Two seconds on Haggis, Clement, starting now. It is state-of-the-art awful. <laughs> so Clement Freud was speaking the whistle went, gained the extra point he's in third place just behind Paul Merton who's just behind Derek Nimmo's in the lead and Eddie Izzard is coming up in fourth place Clement Freud your turn to begin the subject swashbuckling can you tell us something about that subject in just a minute starting now a buckling is a smoked herring normally from Lowestoft or Yarmouth Swash is a different matter altogether. Swashbuckling is a rotten, egregious, arrogant, mean, nasty way to intimidate other people. And it is unusual in this programme. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Was there a sort of slight mispronunciation there? I thought so. Yeah. It's unusualism in yeah. this program. hesitation there. <laughs> well, that was my hearing as well, Paul, mm. so I give uh, well, you... Uh, hearing do you share yes. hearing aid? <laughs> Oh, you can't win with this lot, can you? Right. Uh, Paul, 40 seconds to tell us something about swashbuckling, starting now. Swashbuckling was very popular in the 1940s in the movie houses. <laughs> Stuart Granger, who recently died, was a prime exponent of this. But I suppose the chieftain amongst all swashbucklers <laughs> was Errol Flynn. If there was a swash, he would buckle it without no hesitation at all. He'd be straight in there. In fact, he used to do it all the time. He'd go down to the shops, buy a newspaper, some milk, do a bit of swashbuckling, and then go home and see Mrs Flynn, who was getting his breakfast ready. Um, someone buzzed, but no light came on. Eddie, that's, that's you. Three, buzz three times. No light. My no light's on, coming on, no. Well, can't we just assume when the light doesn't come on that Eddie's channel? <laughs> yeah. I challenged because my light was faulty. <laughs> For swashbuckling with you, starting now. 
Swashbuckling is a great profession. I've often swashed and buckled and grabbed swords and run out into the street and tried to kill people with the sword because... <laughs> Uh, Paul Merton well, challenge. Uh, no, I was going to. He said swords and sword. And I was going to challenge on repetition, but he didn't say. He said swords and swords. He so did I indeed. Thanks for drawing our attention. There, so to I yes. do apologise for any embarrassment I've caused anybody <laughs> with that ridiculous challenge. It wasn't a ridiculous challenge. Is I it? accept He's... that profuse apology, <laughs> and my lawyer will not be in contact. But also, it helps you because you get a point for an incorrect challenge, Eddie. And you continue with four seconds on swashbuckling, starting now. Often I've grabbed things. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of often. Yeah. No. Oh, he said no. after then. After, he said after. Did you say after then? Yes. I have no idea what I said, but what I've said, you were wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought you said after, so the chairman's decision has to be final. And you've got two seconds to tell us more about swashbuckling, starting now. It is a great thing to go out into the... So, Eddie Izzard was then speaking as a whistle went and gained uh, that extra point. And, Derek, it's your turn to begin. Genoa, can you tell us something about that city or that subject in 60 seconds, starting now? The Italian city of Genoa is in a wonderful position right on the northwest corner at the top end of the great toe of Italy. I like to think of the people that were born there, people like Christopher Columbus, for instance. Uh, Clement Floyd Challenge. Reputation of people. Yeah. Yes, there were too many people. Sorry, Derek. And uh, Clements got in with a point. And uh, 47 seconds are left for Genoa, starting now. Genoa is also the name of a sail, as in 40 years before the mast, during which one pulled it up and hiked it down again, and a kind of cake mixture made without fat. Egg yolk, sugar, flour <laughs> and soda would be the ideal ingredients whereby to achieve a Genoa, which is then put into a Victoria sandwich and entered at a Women's Institute fate. <laughs> Frequently achieving first prize or second, sometimes third or highly commended. <laughs> Genoa is a city in Italy, which Derek Nimmo knows awfully well, being a world traveller. It's not one that I care for particularly because they speak Italian. <laughs> Paul, your turn to begin. The subject, pomposity. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute? Don't look at me, please. Because I think you anticipate what Paul might say, starting now. Pomposity is a mixture of two old words, pomp and osity. And perhaps the epitome of pomposity is Nicholas Parsons. He chairs this programme like he's got some idea what's going on. He runs the computer in his brain, which to me I think is probably more of an abacus than a computer. <laughs> Eddie Izzard, you've challenged. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> I just thought I got it then. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, he did things wrong. He did things wrong, <laughs> yes. Can you think of one thing he did wrong? Oh, it was... I can't remember. I got it right. I know I got it. Yeah. Um, every, um, he repeated something that was... Uh, it was vague. <laughs> computer, yes, that's it. No, Thank no, you. Computer. No, no, the second one was computer. Ah! <laughs> Well, that's it. Devi the deviation the from the pronunciation, as marked <laughs> no, down no, in Paul the book of fish. does that, so we, we don't have him for that. So, a repetition of computer, was it? Yeah. All right. 43 yeah, seconds to tell us something about pomposity, starting now. Pomposity is a big, ploughing thing that lands... <coughs> um, Paul Merton challenge. Ploughing? Yeah. <laughs> it's, when, it's a mixture of ploughing and flowering. Mm. And it was a 14th century thing that people, that nuns used to go around um, and they used to build up their, their bodily fluids to an enormous amount and it was part of the basic uh, pomposity well, of... I, well, in that case, why can't I get away with computer? Because <laughs> that's rubbish. Oh, that's not... <laughs> well, so I've got an explanation for mine. We give, Paul, uh, we give Eddie a point for his delightful explanation of his impossible word and uh, give Paul a point for the correct challenge. He takes over the subject, pomposity, 40 seconds, starting now. I knew a man... Oh, funny. Uh, <laughs> I suddenly sounded like I was doing bingo there. <laughs> There's Eddie, a, there's you a baby challenged. crying in Chalet 14. Oh, I just challenged for hesitation of yeah. mind thoughts. That's right, um, hesitation, yes, that's The enough. microphone threw me. Yeah. It's doing it again. The microphone threw you? Yes. It's an old English expression, Nicholas. They didn't, 
dating back to the 13th century. Eddie, you have got a correct challenge, and you have 37 seconds to tell us something about pomposity starting now. Politicians often suffer from pomposity. They stand up in front of large groups of people and talk for hours and hours. <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> It's a tough game, isn't it, Eddie? Uh, Clement, you got in first, yes. Hours and hours and hours and 29 seconds are left. Pomposity starting now. I think of all the professions who are unpompous, politicians rate very highly indeed. <laughs> a pompous politician... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenged. TV Asian, they're tremendously pompous. I would agree with you, uh, De Derek. So you get the subject. 20 seconds on pomposity starting now. I'm an authority on pomposity because I'm one of the most pompous people in the whole of the British Isles. And I like being pompous. I... Uh, Eddie is our challenge. Pompous to pompous. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, it's pompous. Pomposity is a subject, but you can't say pompous twice. Mm -hmm. 12 seconds are left. Pomposity starting now. I've often stood up in front of large groups of people and been terribly pompous because my mother used to say to me when I was very small, only about six or seven or eight or nine... Uh, Paul Merton challenged. Okay. There was about three oars. Yes, you, you... I thought I was being very clever there, doing six, seven... I thought I could go on no, for you hours say six, on seven, eight... I just thought, oh, I could do numbers for hours. <laughs> But then there was but you the mustn't put an or between each number. Yeah, I've already, I'm only starting. Okay. And if you have... <laughs> oh, you've got in, Paul, with one second to go on pomposity starting now. Pomposity! Uh, Eddie. No, 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 Eddie challenged before the whistle went. Well, it was dragging. <laughs> it was he dragging. The... He, was, he was cruising. Tell me, in half a second, I've got halfway through pomposity, and that's dragging. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Eddie, half a second on pomposity, starting now. Pom. Uh, can pom I... <laughs> he hesitated. Yes, he did. Right. I did not. Clement Freud, you got a quarter of a second on pomposity, starting now. <laughs> yes, Eddie. He didn't even think. He didn't right. even start. It's All right. I, anything. I just... I want it You've back. You've a fifth of a second. <laughs> On pomposity, starting now. Hey! Williams <laughs> completely lost control of the points. It doesn't really matter. But according to her, Eddie Izzard is now in the lead. <laughs> Eddie, it's your turn to begin. The subject is miracles. Will you talk on it just a minute, starting now? Politicians often believe in miracles. They stand up and talk for hours or seconds about stuff that goes on, and I never really understood what they really... Oh, no, bugger it. Uh, Derek Nimmer, you challenged him. Yes. What for? Well, the hesitation. Yes, thought. of course, but I have to know. You might oh, sit right. with something else and I might not have allowed it. I thought your um, computer was switched on, you see. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about my mind. There we are. 49 seconds, Derek, for tell us something about miracles, starting now. Miracles, yes, that's rather a good subject, isn't it? I can think of the miracle of uh, the Feast of Cana. I wish I could do that trick, you know, to get all that water and turn it into wine. How exciting, how profitable it would be. People do is 12.5%. Uh, Eddie is our new child. Mm, how how exciting, how profitable. Yes, well done, Eddie. Listen well. 36 seconds, you take back the subject. Another point to you. Miracles, starting now. Miracles come in different sizes. Some are green and some are blue. Uh, Clement Roy challenge. Repetition of some. Some are green and some are blue, yes. <laughs> and 32 seconds for you, Clement, to tell us something about miracles starting now. It does rather surprise me that when you turn water into wine... Uh, Eddie is our child. No, I take that back. It was just your, your style has a hesitation built in, which is... <laughs> which I is... mean, there's a, there's a gap between words. Uh, yes. <laughs> Can I say some gaps are more equal than others? <laughs> and the words, he has a more normal gap between his words than some of yours, Eddie. Is well, there's some gaps are gaps, and some gaps are sort of gaps and a bit more, yeah, you know, yeah, and I just well. thought... I'd get so the chairman has to judge. On this occasion, I disagree, Eddie, yeah. so Clement keeps the subject. 28 seconds, miracle starting now. And that particular miracle 
is replicated almost daily in restaurants where they turn wine into water. <laughs> and no one ever seems to complain about it. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. A deviation, it's not replicated if the wine's turning into water. If it was water turning into wine, it would be replicated. A very clever challenge, yes. Reproducing what was done in the Bible on this occasion, it was reverse. So, well, listen, well, sorry, well, well, it's a replication of a miracle. Uh, no, I think it was a very clever interpretation good, of good, deviation. Good. <laughs> Paul has a point, and 17 seconds on miracles starting now. I woke up one morning and looked in the air in cupboard, and there was a huge cake singing a Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> I thought, this is extraordinary. I don't know any other piece of confectionery that could carry a popular tune. And yet, there it was. I then realised... <laughs> Right, so a very even contest. Eddie Izzard is still just in the lead, one point ahead of Paul Merton and Clement Freud and three ahead of Derek Nimmo as we enter the last round. Cloud nine is the subject, a good subject to finish on. Clement Sartazov, 60 seconds, beginning now. Some years ago, I picked up a piece of sheet music and saw that it was headed page nine and then realised it was actually Paganini. And I have an idea that Cloud9 is not totally dissimilar from that. I've never... uh, Paul Merton Chapman. It's a deviation. The subject's Cloud9. Yes, it's not Page9, it's Cloud9. I don't think we've got onto Cloud9 yet. Uh... Well, give me a chance. <laughs> well, you've had 15 seconds, and in this game, oh, if you haven't got it by 15 seconds, uh -huh. we, you've deviated. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, I agree with your challenge. 45 seconds left. Cloud nine starting now. It's one of these phrases that people use to describe people whose feet perhaps... Uh, oh. Derek Nimmer. <laughs> Repetition of people. Yes, that's right. 40 seconds are left. Cloud nine starting now. I am always on cloud nine when I'm in this beautiful city of Edinburgh. Having my haggis for breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, every possible meal available, wandering around the Royal Mile, smiling faces, looking at kilts, tartan everywhere, little hats, pretty old ladies, grass on the meadows, and of course the fringe. And what do I see at the fringe? I see Mr... Uh, a Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of fringe. Yes, you mentioned the fringe before, but uh, the 16 seconds, Paul, you've got in with... Uh, on this subject, Cloud Nine starting now. My hobby as a child was collecting clouds and I would number them and keep them in my bedroom. My favourite, undoubtedly, was Cloud Nine. Cloud Eight, not so sure about. Cloud Eleven, there, but not really. But Cloud Nine was the one. <laughs> Well, as I said a moment ago, that was to be the last round, and now I'll give you the final score. A very close-run contest again, but just to mention, Derek Nimmer finished in fourth place, one point behind Clement Freud, he was one point behind Eddie Izzard, and just ahead of Eddie was Paul Merton, so this week he is our winner! <laughs> it only remains for me to... Thank our, our four intelligent and talented panellists for the contribution they made to make this such a delightful show. I thank also Miriam Jones, who's kept the score and blown the whistle so well, our creator of the game, Ian Messiter, our producer, Sarah Smith, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, and all of us here, to this lovely audience on the Fringe in Edinburgh. Thank you very much, and to We're On The Air, I'm playing Just A Minute A Game. Goodbye! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome the four diverse personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back three regular players of the game, that is Paul Merton, Peter Jones and Clement Freud, and we welcome someone who's never played the game before, and that is Greg Proops. Would, would you welcome all four of them? Yeah. 
Besides me, sits Miriam Jones, who's going to keep a score and blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And as usual, I will ask them all to speak on the subject that I will give them. And they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And this particular recording of Just a Minute is coming from the Pleasance Theatre on the Fringe during the Edinburgh Festival. We'll begin the show this week with uh, Paul Merton. Paul, will you talk on the subject of Princes Street starting now? Princes Street is a long thoroughfare that runs through the centre of Edinburgh. It is a... And Peter Jones' challenge. Hesitation. He hesitated, he got into Princes Street, and he has to stop. 55 seconds are left. You get a point, of course, Peter, for a correct challenge. You take over the subject of Princes Street starting now. I remember so well my first sight of it when I came here on tour, theatrical, uh, that is, and stayed with Mrs. McNabb in Four Brome Place. What a wonderful place it was. This uh, was the best <coughs> theatrical um, digs. Paul Merton's challenge. <coughs> Repetition of place. There were two places, yes. That's right. Yes, I stayed <coughs> with Mrs. McNabb too when I was on tour. <laughs> yes. A lovely old lady she was. 41 seconds are left. Paul, you've got a, a point for a correct challenge. Princess Street starting now. And if you walk down Princess Street, even today, you can see Mrs. McNabb busking away, <laughs> trying to earn enough money for a second operation. Uh, Peter Jones, a child. Uh, no, you can't. You can't. She's gone to a better place. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, yes. 36 seconds, Peter. Correct challenge. Princess Street starting now. And whatever operations she had, I don't know anything about. But she did provide the most wonderful coal fires and an extraordinary lavatory. The chain was disappeared into the ceiling uh, of the room above. I don't know how it was arranged, but it was such a long way up. And you pulled this and waited a long time, and then occasionally a little water came down. And <laughs> Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of long. A long, yes. It was too long, yes. yes. <laughs> Paul Merton, you got in. Another point, another correct challenge. Uh, Twelve seconds, Princess Street starting now. I've often stood in the centre of Princess Street and looked up at the castle at the top of the hill and wondered whether the people there looked down on Princess... <laughs> Uh, Clement Freud challenge. The repetition of looked. Mm. Yes, there was too much looking. Uh, and Clement, you got in with four seconds on Princess Street starting now. I have often looked up Princess Street and occasionally... <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point and this occasion was Clement Freud. And um, they're all equal, actually, at this particular moment, so we'll carry on with the show. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject... How, how can Greg be equal with anybody? I <laughs> I'll say that again. I mean, if there's a rule that you get points for not saying anything, then <laughs> it's no, going to no. be an odd kind of no, show. No, no, no. And I we... think I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we've got the score right now. Um, Clement has got an extra one for speaking the whistle wind. He and Peter Jones and Paul Merton are equal in the lead, and Greg Proops has yet to score. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is my worst joke, and there are 60 seconds to tell us something about it, starting now. My worst joke is about an Englishman, a Scotsman, an Irishman, and a Welshman who met up with a Finn, a Dane, several other Scandinavians, <laughs> a Bulgarian, a Romanian... And somebody who came from Czechoslovakia. They went to a restaurant in order to have breakfast. And the waiter said, what sort of cereals would you like? Have you got all bran, frosties, shredded wheat, muesli, or would you prefer porridge, said the man in the white coat, to which nobody actually had an answer, with the exception of the goat, who mentioned that the higher the fewer would be preferable to sitting in Westminster Abbey on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Paul Merton oh, Challenge. This is just rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> it is not the first time that rubbish you, has been spoken in just a minute. Do you I mean it's not a very good joke? <laughs> no, no, I've heard, I've, I have heard worse. Yeah. You have heard worse. <laughs> well, I quite, I couldn't agree on that. I haven't heard worse. So, Clement gets another point. 13 seconds. My worst joke starting now. Who was that lady I saw you with last night? That was not a female. It happened to be a relative of mine. <laughs> uh, Paul Merton Challenge. Well, he's doing another joke now. They can't both be his worst joke. <laughs> Uh, 
That is a correct challenge. Paul, deviation, uh, point to you. Five seconds, my worst joke, starting now. There's two flies playing... Uh, Greg, uh, proves your challenge. I just happen to know that's not Paul's worst joke. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen his act, and that doesn't even come close. Right, so we enjoy the challenge, Greg. So what I'm going to do is give you a bonus point, because the audience love that challenge. Thanks, Nick. Yes, yes, there it is. And, uh, but it, it, Paul was interrupted, so he gets a point for that. And three seconds on my worst joke, Paul, starting now. And one fly says to the <laughs> other... Uh, Peter Jones' challenge. Uh, repetition of flies. Yes, you mentioned no, the I flies. said two flies. Oh, you're two right, flies. you did say two flies, and this is one fly. Oh, I see. Yes. Mm. And you can... <laughs> But that's how you play the game. <laughs> so, Paul, you've still got uh, one second to make some more points. My worst joke starting now. And looking down. <laughs> so, Paul Mutton was then speaking as a whistle when gained the extra point for doing so. He's now taking a strong lead at the end of that round. Peter Jones, will you take the next round? The subject, Getting the Bird. 60 seconds, starting now. Well, here in Scotland, a great many people go to a lot of trouble and expense to get the bird on the moors when they start shooting. These ludicrous people dressed in heather-woven suits and things with a lot of beaters. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Greg, did you challenge? No, but I will if you like. Yes, right. <laughs> I'm just kind of bored right now. Yes, right. <laughs> well, I'm sorry it happened to me. I was speaking. <laughs> No, that's exactly why, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it was, what was it, deviation on heather-woven suits? Yes, that's what it was. Yes, yes. Right, right. It was very perceptive of you, by the way. No, no. no I <laughs> thought it was your quick perception that I was really impressed with. Yes, I think that's deviation, a heather-woven suit. Uh, 46 seconds for you, Greg, to tell us something about... Haven't getting... you ever heard of a heather mixture? <laughs> yes. I'm that, sorry, I, I withdraw the... No, the no, no, that, that, I... that is the appearance, the heather mixture. It's not the weaving. So, uh, Greg, of course it's the weaving. That's what it's makes not the it a mixture. It's not the material. Greg, you have a correct challenge. 46 seconds. Getting the bird starting now. A bird that people often want to receive is a little-known bird of the highlands called the heather bird. It's not exactly the weave of the bird's feathers. It's just the look of them and their luminosity as they wing their way across the locks and areas of this festive land. Each heather bird... Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Hesitation. Yes, I think it was hesitation. Oh, you were going I'm sorry, so there was well. a dramatic pause. Maybe you... <laughs> Paula, if you had been trained as an actor, as mm -hmm. I had, yes. yeah. you would know how to milk an audience like he was milking them just then. <laughs> so it was a definite hesitation, Greg. So uh, Paul's got in 30 seconds on getting the bird starting now. This is a phrase which often refers to somebody who's been on stage who hasn't gone down very well with the audience, and they get the bird. It's a kind of noise, like a sort of <laughs> sound. And, and uh, Greg, challenge. I love his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I could swim in your eyes. Did you really? Yeah. What's that got to do with just a minute? I'm sorry, I was deviating. <laughs> He gets a point for being interrupted. 18 seconds, Paul, on getting the bird starting now. Every Christmas, my mother would promise to make us a turkey. Well, she wouldn't make it. I mean, she was crazy <laughs> by God. <but> she'd <laughs> Clement it. Freud challenge. Repetition of make. Yes. Yeah. 14 seconds, Clement, getting the bird starting now. The French call it recevé l'oiseau. And it's one of the few six-letter words that includes every single vowel in the alphabet. O-I-E-A-U. Not necessarily in the correct order, but there they are. Clement Freud was then speaking as a whistle and gained the extra point for doing so. He's uh, in second place behind Paul Merton, our leader. Uh, Greg Proops, will you take the next round? The subject, gizmos. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us something about that in this game starting now? One of the most popular gizmos that's virtually unheard of in the United Kingdom is a gizmo that Nicholas Parsons often uses. It's called the defashionizing machine. <laughs> he puts his suits through it each morning so that all... <laughs> Scintillas of taste or decorum are removed, and you're left with what a circus clown would wear. <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, Nicholas is not the first to use the... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Two Nicholases. Yes, you repeated Nicholas. Oh, I was referring to another Nick. You don't know him. He lives in my neighborhood. 
Sorry, go ahead. Mind you, I didn't mind you repeating that, but uh, I'm afraid within the rules of the game it was repetition. So, Clement, 36 seconds to tell us something about gizmos starting now. Gizmos is very nearly an anagram of moggies, which are <laughs> cats and other nasty, obscene animals which litter the streets of Edinburgh, especially princes. <laughs> Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation. He came to a full stop. Yes. 23 seconds. Gizmos with you, Paul, starting now. I used to buy Superman comics when I was younger, and the back pages of this particular publication was filled with adverts for all kind of weird and wonderful inventions. X-ray specs was something that I always wanted to... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Two somethings. Yes. 11 seconds. Gizmos. Clement, starting now. One of my favourite gizmos appears every other week at the Leicester Square Theatre, and I very seldom miss these great appearances. Then <laughs> 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 got the extra point. He's now one point behind Paul Merton, who's our leader, and Greg Proofs and Peter Jones are trailing a little to equal in third place. Paul Merton, your turn to begin. The subject, a doddle. I was walking down the street the other day and a man said to me, could you possibly put this piece of litter into the bin? I said, well, of course, it would be a doddle. And when I performed this particular task, he decided to give me an awful amount of money. He, I was given £5,000 by this very gentleman simply because I had placed this piece of rubbish in the aforementioned receptacle. <laughs> oh, uh, Peter Jones challenge. It was shot through with repetition. <laughs> well, give me one repetition. Um, <laughs> rubbish. I can't remember. But I mean, there were an awful lot of repetitions. Of, uh, putting unless it in you, the, unless, the litter. And unless all that you sort can of give thing. me one, peace, I can't. Peace, I, peace. peace. Ah, yes, all right, peace. He did mention <laughs> the word peace twice. Right, 39 seconds for you, Peter, on a doddle starting now. Yes, it's something to do with smoking a pipe, I think. There's a lot of doddle in the bottom of it. With, uh, it's very unpleasant stuff, I believe. People, you see them spitting it out onto the street if they're uh, puffing away at one of these briar things that they have in their mouth, with tobacco, a lot of it, and they uh, soil the pavement and the gutter, and altogether it's a very unpleasant thing to have. And uh, I advise you to get rid of it, if you've got any, in the uh, base of your uh, puffing instrument. <coughs> <laughs> Paul, you challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation, I think so, yes. Yes, it seemed rather a long time to me. I don't know how it felt. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the sake of our listeners, I should explain. I think they were being a little bit unkind, letting people stagger on. They knew he'd hesitated a long time previously, but Paul couldn't cope with it anymore. Oh, you're just being sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Paul got in with five seconds to go on the subject of a doddle starting now. I was sitting in my living room one afternoon when I suddenly looked down at... <laughs> Uh, Greg uh, Proops, yes. This has nothing to do with the beginning of the story in which he was discussing a woman who gave him a large amount of money to put something in the rubbish bin. That's true. That is perfectly true, but he can still do that in just a minute. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> I could still swim in your eyes. <laughs> I know you're playing to them magnificently. Greg, an incorrect challenge, and uh, you've, uh, Paul's got another point, and he's only got half a second on a doddle starting now. Mount Everest. <laughs> So at the end of that round, Paul Merton has increased his lead. And, Peter, your turn to begin. The subject is how to make a million. Can you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Well, you don't say a million what. I don't know what you're referring to, really. It could be a million enemies. You could make a million enemies by appearing <laughs> on television and, and uh, saying... Paul Merton challenge. A repetition of enemies. Too many enemies, Peter, I'm afraid. Oh, yes. Yes. So, Paul... <laughs> You've got in 52 seconds on how to make a million, starting now. It's quite clear that I have no idea how to make a million, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here next to Nicholas Parsons <laughs> playing just a minute. Because I would be out somewhere, possibly cruising around the Caribbean in a luxury yacht, waving to natives as they pass by, hello, there's Mrs McNabb, over there is somebody else, and I would... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Two of theirs. Over there, yes, there's somebody else, yes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Man, he is never, strict. We've never had such a prejudiced audience in my life. <laughs> They've all taken sides. They know who they want to win right. 32 seconds, Clement. How to make a million starting now. On a financial basis, the very best way to make a million would be to go to a South American country 
where one pound is probably worth 45 million, whatever the denomination is. Italy, I would like to recommend, where 2,400 lira or thereabouts is equal to one sterling unit. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of equal? Yes. We had equal before, yes. <laughs> Twelve seconds for you, Paul. Another point to you, how to make a million, starting now. It is often said that the best way to make a million is to start with a million. Millionaires have no trouble acquiring more of the same. If you were starting at the lower rung of the ladder, it's very difficult to see how you... Paul Merton was again speaking as the whistle went, and he has increased his lead at the end of that round. A great proof it's your turn to begin. The subject, genes. 60 seconds starting now. Genes were invented in California during the gold rush by one Mr. Levi Strauss, who put steel rivets on the front of the crotch, if you will. The miners found, however, when they stood next to the fire to warm themselves at night, that the bolts that had been put on the front of their jeans heated up to extreme temperatures, and they were forced to leap back for the fire, ripping down their pants and disclosing their undershorts to the other miners. This led to many campfire romances <laughs> in the Old West, which, of course, led to the overpopulation of California, which we have today. Now, I've said California at least 15 times. <laughs> And Paul Merton was the first to challenge. A repetition, California, yeah, California. 12 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 25 seconds, Paul. Jeans starting now. They are a very popular trouser for people to wear, I suppose, because they're hard wearing. The word denim, I believe, comes from a French town called Denim, uh, where this material was first invented. <laughs> Levi Strauss was a man who used to stay with Mrs. McNabb in Princess Street. <laughs> and he would watch her every night and he'd get the idea for himself to build himself a new. <laughs> Uh, Clement Freud challenge. To himself. Himself, yes. Clement, you've got him with two seconds to go on jeans, starting now. Jeans is the plural of Jean. The pl <laughs> Clement Freud was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so, but he's still in second place behind Paul Merton, our leader. And Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject, fair. We do talk on that subject in this game, starting now. Oh, how I love fun fairs. I walk around and soak up the atmosphere. Candy floss, merry-go-rounds, ghost trains, big dippers, toffee apples, sawdust, clowns, acrobats, merry children running around with excited smiles on their faces. <laughs> Mummy, can I have a go on this? I don't know what it is. Uh, Peter Jones are challenged. That sawdust in the middle of that. Uh, I don't know what would be fascinating about sawdust. <laughs> Didn't seem to fit in quite to me. I think it's a, it's a, it's a thing I associate immediately with funfairs, Peter. I'm sure the audience agree. Do you agree? Yes. I always bow to their superior wow. judgment and wisdom. Right? I'd have to say that was a wicked, weak <laughs> challenge, Peter. Yeah. So you don't have to say that at all. I'm just recognizing it. This is I've your made first and very likely last appearance <laughs> in this game. <laughs> And we can do without that kind of extraneous comment. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, you get another point there. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Mm. <laughs> Forty seconds uh, with you, Paul, on fair starting now. I've always fancied having blonde hair, so I went down to the chemist last week and bought a bottle of peroxide. That's why you see me now sitting here as the living image of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I get stopped in the street by people who say, but you're gorgeous. I, what's the difference? And I say, look, it's my hair. It's now... Uh, Clement <laughs> Freud has challenged. Two hairs. Yes, you turned back your hair. Tonight. Well, I thought I'd have it all done, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I must explain to our listeners, he hasn't dyed his hair. It's not all peroxide. It's his natural colour, as far as we know. Um, 21 seconds for you. <laughs> it's grey your natural colour, presumably. <laughs> no, I've dyed it that colour. <laughs> yes. Make myself look older and more mature so I can be in this position and you can take the mickey out of me. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of people wouldn't have made the effort, but thank you. <laughs> So, 21 seconds for you, <laughs> Clement. Subject is fair, starting now. If someone was to say that Nicholas Parsons is fair, they would possibly be talking about his complexion or maybe the colour of his teeth, but he is totally bent. Not only that. 
possibly the worst chairman that any panel game has... Greg Pooks, who challenged? I believe I heard two possiblys. An absolute rubbish as well. No, no, I think everybody's in agreement with the actual... So I, my job's on the line, is it, Clement? Right. No, no, it's not on the line. It's, um, you've been sacked. <laughs> By the team. Greg, yes, you were correct. Repetition. Oh, I was. Yes. <laughs> then I'd like my point now. You've got your point, and you've Cheers. got four seconds to go on the subject of fair starting now. Fairs are often wonderful and magical places for children of... So Greg Poops was then speaking as the whistle went, and he gained an extra point for doing so, and he's moved forward, but he's still in third place. Peter Jones is trailing a little, Clement Freud's in second, and Paul Merton is still our leader. Clement, will you take the next round? The subject, press. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Press is what you would do to your jeans if they were baggy or had anything other than sharp, razor-edged creases, which I don't believe trousers normally do, and look... I think, to me, particularly unimpressive when so tailored. I once lived... Paul, you challenged hesitation. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Somebody just laid an egg in the front row. <laughs> 39 seconds on uh, press, Paul, starting now. I should think in about half an hour's time this building will be surrounded by the press because a lady in the front row has laid an egg. This will surely make the front page of every single newspaper in Great Britain. The Sun, The Mirror, Telegraph, Guardian, Times will all rush to this very venue, eager to get a photograph and a first... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Not all of them. The feathered world will try and keep it a secret. <laughs> Peter, we like the challenge, and we haven't heard from you for ages. 20 seconds on press, starting now. The press, what an interesting subject. <laughs> <laughs> how do they... How do they think of it? Wait a minute, uh, you were challenged. Oh, was I? Yes? Uh, hesitation? No, I disagree. Come yes, on, sorry. Peter. Uh, <laughs> 17 seconds on the press, starting now. Press is the word you see on a bell push, and the instruction is to press on it, you see, and it's about the only electronic device that rarely fails. Even these buzzers that we have in our hands, they don't have that magic word on them, but they have been known. <laughs> Peter Jones kept going to the whistle end, gained an extra point for doing so, and uh, he's still in fourth place. Greg Proops, it's your turn to begin. The subject is What I Read. 60 seconds starting now. My main subject of interest is baseball, the history of which I am very interested in. 1903, the first World Series. The Boston Americans played the Pittsburgh Nationals. They won five games to three. 1904. No show was played. 1905, the New York Giants played the Philadelphia... Uh, Paul Merton Challenge. Three played. Yes, and 19 as well. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> Paul, the correct challenge, 37 seconds. What I read, starting now. I read all about baseball all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, Greg, you've got in there, yes. <laughs> I think it's obvious. Yes. <laughs> All right, 34 seconds. What I read, Greg, starting now. Paul's comprehensive knowledge of the game of baseball... <laughs> uh, Clement Freud challenge. Reputation of baseball. You mentioned baseball before. Oh, I see. Yes. I thought I had a fresh new start. No, no, no. <laughs> you can say what you like, what you've said in this round, in another round, but you can't repeat it in this round. I'm utterly confused by that explanation. Thank you. <laughs> I defer to Mr. Freud. Yes, Mr. Freud has it. 30 seconds, Clement. What I read, starting now. What I read is predominantly books, magazines, <laughs> papers, and periodicals. But every now and again, I come across original manuscripts, which I read from left to right unless they are in Sanskrit, when the process is reversed. <laughs> Words, syllables, letters are often interspersed by pictures, which I take in my sight normally, even if the pages are not turned by my butler, who is employed...
So at the end of that round, uh, Clement Floyd was then speaking as a whistle when, gained an extra point. He's still in second place. We have time for one more round. Clement Floyd, it's your turn to begin. It could be anybody's contest, still except for Peter Jones and Greg Proops. But... <laughs> uh, Clement, the subject is painting a master. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? Painting a master used to be punished by four hours' detention in the school to which I went. One got this master, undressed him, and slapped red, blue, green, yellow, and red colouring all over... Uh, Paul Merton Chapman. Repetition of red. Yes. Uh, Paul, you've got in with 45 seconds to go on this subject. Painting a master starting now. I believe that Vincent van Gogh sold very few paintings during his lifetime, but the pictures that have survived him are now sold for millions of pounds. Uh, Greg, um, proves challenge. Sold twice. Yes, he didn't sell many, oh, yeah, well. he only sold twice. Right, yeah. 35 seconds, painting a master starting now. In baseball, when one throws a pitch over the outside part of the plate, it's called painting. One of the masters at this trade was Steve Carlton, also known as Lefty, who threw the spheroid horsehide-covered thing through the air, across the dish, whiffing many batters. This makes no sense to many people in England, much like wearing a white V-neck jumper during a cricket game makes no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, Paul Merton Challenge. Repetition of sense. Yeah, you had too much sense in there, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Call me Jane Austen. <laughs> And then ask me dancing. Right, there we are, yes. If you will. So, you were applauding his erudition, obviously. Twelve seconds for you, Paul. <laughs> Someone has to. <laughs> but painting a master is the subject. There are twelve seconds left with you, Paul, starting now. William Turner specialised in painting seascapes. He would get a ship, some water, a bit of paint, and would look up at it and think, yes, I think that's going to be two by... <laughs> Well, at the end of the show, uh, I just have to say that Peter Jones and uh, Greg Proops, who uh, didn't get many points, but they gave incredible contributions. Yeah. Yeah. Clement Freud gave his equally good contribution, gained a number of points. But the winner in this week's show, that was Paul Merton. For me to thank our four talented players of the game, I also must thank Miriam Jones, who's kept the score, also the creator of the game, Crossier Messeter, who keeps us in work, and our producer, Sarah Smith. And from me, Nicholas Parsons, and all of them, goodbye until we play once more, just a minute. Bye bye! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to introduce the four panellists who this week are going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back Peter Jones and Paul Merton, who've played the game quite a number of times, Stephen Fry, who's played it a few times, and Jan Ravens, who's only played it once before. But would you please welcome all four of them! <laughs> Miriam Jones sits beside me with a whistle and a stopwatch. She'll keep the score, blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up, and uh, I will ask our four panellists mm. to speak in turn, if they can, on the subject that I give them. And they will try and do that, as usual, without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject on the card. Paul Merton, would you begin the show, and the subject which I'm sure has been specially chosen for you, metalwork. <laughs> You have mentioned it more than once in your professional life. Will you tell us something about it now in 60 seconds? 
Starting now. It is true that between the ages of 13 and 15, I attended metalwork lessons, both theory and practical. At the end of this particular exercise, I gained CSE ungraded in the subject, <laughs> which is extremely good because it was quite clear that no amount of knowledge had found its way into my brain at all. I didn't want to do metalwork, but unfortunately I didn't have the French, and so I had to do this rather arcane little subject. I can't see what the point of it was. I didn't no intention of becoming a blacksmith when I left school and, and since then I've not really used it in any practical way I think purely because I was completely Peter Jones a challenge he hesitated a bit I, think. I did yes he did yes Peter you have got a correct challenge which is a point to you of course 23 seconds are left metal work starting now I remember my daughter was taught metal work when she was at school because the boys were being coached in cooking and needlework in a vain effort to try to make everybody the same and she made a very nice coat hook which we still have in use <laughs> but that is all two years it took altogether <laughs> You can't hang a hat on it. It's only got the single curve. <laughs> Nevertheless... <laughs> when the whistle goes, it tells us that 60 seconds are up. And whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Peter Jones, who's the only one to have scored in that round. So, Peter, you're on a strong lead. Uh, Stephen Fry, will you take the next round? Achilles' heel, will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Well, of course, the background of the Achilles' heel was the Greek hero, Achilles, whose mother Thetis dipped him in the waters of Lysi, also known as the liquids of forgetfulness, in order to protect him. However, her hand held his heel as he was submerged in this rushing torrent. Therefore, the part that was not covered in the fluid was vulnerable, totally open to attack. The rest of him was impenetrable and impermeable. It therefore fell out during the Trojan War that Paris, one of the Iliad uh, heroes, of course... Uh, oh. Paul Merton oh. challenge. Oh, oh, Unfortunately, hesitation. Yes. <laughs> got a point. You've got the subject. Well, it was very good, but it was, yes. it was a shame. And you've got... It was. <laughs> It is going so well. 29 seconds, Achilles' heel starting now. My Achilles' heel is that I find Nicholas Parsons intensely sexually attractive. <laughs> when I look over there at that blazer and that tie, his hair, the glasses, everything about him says, take me. I don't know what it is. I go home at night, I see these visions of this erstwhile chairman coming towards me, the silvery glints in his eyes beckoning... Stephen Fry, you challenged. Uh, this is not an Achilles heel, this is a strength. It is. <laughs> Whose strength? I share. Um, <laughs> I find it, it arms me for the day. Uh, Jan, you wish to say something? I wish to say this is deviation on the part of both of them in a bit. <laughs> Oh, you don't control. share that feeling. I'm not ashamed that Nicholas Sadly, is my no. favourite oh, fortissimo right, fantasy. No, no. I think it's something to be very proud of. I beg to what... differ, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that's all right, Jan. Everybody to their own. Uh, the, uh... <laughs> Paul, it's six seconds on Achilles' heel starting now. I suppose my Achilles' heel is that I... Uh, uh, Stephen Fry. Did he hesitate? Did yes, he I was going to say that, yes. Yes. Well, Stephen, three seconds to tell us something about your Achilles' heel starting now. And the arrow went straight into Achilles' heel and he perished. <laughs> Well, after that round, I don't know whether I'm going to quite be able to carry on. You never know. Especially some of the letters I might get from people abroad who've never seen me. Uh, <laughs> They've probably got a very odd view of you in China, haven't they? I know, I know. Yeah. And do you know something very interesting? They take the programme over there in order to model their English, and I want to know who they're modelling it on. <laughs> might have little Paul Mertens coming over here with uh, Chinese accents right now. Uh, where were <laughs> I look forward to that rather unlikely yes. event <laughs> unfolding in front of my eyes. <laughs> Peter, your turn to begin. The subject is wrong numbers. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? I think I must have a wrong number. Now, this is absolutely true, because five times in the last two weeks, I've had messages on the answering machine asking for a male stripper. <laughs> now, my wife has encouraged me to go and apply for this job. <laughs> 
<laughs> but they haven't made me an offer I can't refuse. In fact, I've not been in conversation with these ladies. All of them were females. But you see, I've done a lot of things like carry on. And <laughs> Stephen oh, Fry. Sorry, it was, it was a reflex from my thumb. It was so interesting. It seemed a bit hesitant there. It, he was definitely it was, hesitant. Yes, he was. thought well, of all it's the things. a delicate he... subject, you know. <laughs> Worry me, Peter, was you thought of all the things you'd done and you dried up. Yeah, so would you if you'd done some of the things I've done. <laughs> Stephen, the correct challenge, 34 seconds, wrong numbers, starting now. I'm always getting a wrong number. I ring up Peter Jones, the department store in Chelsea, and ask for a male stripper, and I get this very baffled <laughs> man saying that he doesn't think I've called the right place. I can't understand you. So I've had to switch my allegiance to another store whose, whose number I have corrected. Uh, Jan, you've challenged. Repetition of store. There were two stores. Oh, well, listen, Jan, yes, you have a correct challenge. There are 19 seconds for you to tell us something about wrong numbers starting now. It's only too easy to phone a wrong number. For example, if one were to try and contact the emergency services and dial 987, that would be incorrect. And also, if one were to try and get in touch with directory inquiries and ring 132, one... <laughs> Jan Ravens was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so. And Jan, it's your turn to begin. The subject, hairs. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Well, hairs, of course, is a most thorny problem for women, the superfluous variety which one has to try and get rid of for some reason we don't quite know why. Electrolysis is one way of ridding oneself of superfluous... Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of one. Yes, there was too many ones, I'm afraid. Too many Jane. ones. Yes. Paul, will you tell us something about hairs? There are 47 seconds, starting now. I can't think of hairs without thinking of the silver... Uh, Stephen Fry challenge. Terrible mistake, I do apologise. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Could happen to anybody. Carry on. Sort of. Ah, but if you interrupt someone, uh, that person gets a point. Oh, quite right, yes. yes no, right. You should pay for my so mistake. So Paul <laughs> has another point. Hairs is still the subject. 44 seconds, starting now. I have a friend of mine who breeds electric hairs, specially for the greyhound tracks. <laughs> And what he does is he gets hold of the hair and he mates it with a battery and it can be 12 <laughs> volts or 15 of that particular measurement and he takes them to the stadium. Uh, Stephen Fry, Two takes there. There, there were two takes, yes. He was taking too much there. 30 seconds are left for hairs with you, Stephen, starting now. I've only met two hairs. One was David Hare, who's a well-known playwright. The other was Doris Hare, who's a marvellous old actress. Used to be on the buses, of course. I was in a play with her. Of the two hairs, I couldn't really say who was my favourite. They're both super people. Of course, there's the animal, which is rather like a rabbit. Hairs come out apparently in March and are rather lunatic or deranged in some fashion. Again, one doesn't quite understand why. There was a great mad hair march of that uh, month that came from. <laughs> a strange word order. <laughs> so, Jan, you got in first then. <laughs> Repetition of March. Seven seconds for you on hairs starting now. There is. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Hesitation. No. <laughs> away. You could have parked a bus in that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think she has it enough to lose it, but do get moving a bit quicker, Jan. Six seconds for hairs starting now. There are some barbaric types that indulge in a practice called hair coursing, which involves two dogs chasing a hair down a burrow or something. <laughs> Paul, it's your turn to begin with the subject rather aptly that's come up. Um, it's China. So will you tell us something about China in this game, starting now? I believe that China is a country just outside Romford in Essex. <laughs> and here the Chinese people live happily and gaily. They sing and dance in the streets and congratulate themselves that they are living so close to Western civilization. Of course, China is also a place that's somewhere out there where they pick up just a minute and they... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jan Ravens, your challenge first. Hesitation. Yes, 40 seconds for you to tell us something Don't about stop. China starting now. Pretty China is something that I love to collect at antique fairs. I go and buy cups, saucers, plates, bowls, all with lovely designs like Clarice Cliff from the Art Deco period as a very nice type of China with little houses and flowers and yellow backgrounds and that sort of thing. Um, uh, <laughs> Stephen Fry. Well, I think I'm really... Oh, um, I think it's pretty... Hesitation, yes. China's with you, Stephen. There are 20 seconds left, starting now. Because bones 
China is so-called because bits of ossified material of animal uh, nature were, in fact, inserted into the mix which tried to reproduce the genuine China which had been imported from the place that is now the People's Republic of China, but was then, of course, a series of kingdoms and part of an empire. And uh, it was generally supposed... Uh, uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. He said, and uh, He did yes. say, and uh, Yes, well, listen, Peter. Two seconds. You've got in just before the whistle on China starting now. Worcester. Minton, Spode. There, there's the example. Peter Jones speaking as the whistle end gained the extra point. He's still in third place, and Jan Raven's still in the lead. And Stephen Fry, your turn to begin. The subject is quacks. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? Quacks, well, word meaning charlatans, I suppose, isn't it? Sort of fraudulent doctors, that kind of thing. Also the noise that a duck makes. It goes quack like that, I believe. I never actually heard it. It usually goes quack like that. <laughs> the same thing. However, there have been many famous mountebanks in history who've tried to put one over the various people. And they, the word quacks really sort of covers them, I suppose, doesn't it? Do you know, I'm getting awfully bored with this. I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> so, Jan, Jan... I just you... felt I had to get him out of mm. it Yes, somehow. you've helped yes. him. 39 seconds, Jan, quacks, starting now. A lot of quacks are said to be in the field of alternative medicine, which is sometimes called complementary, which doesn't mean that your doctor says, you look very well today and you instantly feel better. It's a sort of adjunct to the uh, mainstream. And Stephen challenged. Bit of an R there. 27 seconds quacks with you, Stephen, starting now. Well, placebos are often given by all kinds of apparently respectable doctors and often seem to work. In the sort of snake oil days... Uh, Paul Merton challenged. Repetition of often. Often, yes, you had often too often there. Did I? And yes. God, 19 seconds for you, Paul, on quacks, starting now. I had a pet duck when I was about 14 that used to console me when I came back from school and said, this metal work is just not going into my head. I don't understand any of it. And the duck would look me sadly. Um, Stephen Challenge. Two ducks. Yeah, two ducks. ducks. Yes, mm. two ducks. Seven mm. seconds, Stephen. Quacks, starting now. Very common in the American West for people to go around in wagons trying to sell patent medicines of one kind or another which contain nothing more usually than sugar, these people. So Stephen Fry was speaking as the whistle went, gained other points in the round, and he's moved forward into the lead one ahead of Jan Ravens, and then Peter Jones and Paul Merton are equal in third place. Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject is vermouth. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Vermouth, or vermouth as it's often called in America, is an indispensable part of the great classic cocktail, the dry martini. Five parts of gin or vodka to one of vermouth makes a very nice drink. I prefer it shaken rather than stirred, as Ian Fleming advocated, because if it's put into a shaker with lumps of ice, a little water gets into it, and it's not quite as strong. It doesn't anesthetize you in quite the same way as it would if you had it neat. Now, the Ian Flem... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you actually wet all their sort of saliva. Uh, going, you know, they're, wet they're... our saliva? No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What are, yeah. you what are they going to make of that phrase in China? <laughs> <laughs> Salivating at the mouth is the word I was saying. You That's right, there, yes, yes. You sit there sort of um, appetite. Salivating at the elbow, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder we're a confused country over there. <laughs> Right, 24 seconds for you, Stephen, on vermouth starting now. W.C. Fields advocated is the perfect martini to take a bottle of vermouth or vermouth and remove the lid and wave it over a glass filled with gin and then replace the stopper. That way it was dry enough. Of course, vermouth derives from... Paul Merton Jones. Hesitation? I think so, mm. yes, Paul. Nine seconds for you to tell us something about vermouth starting now. I suppose of all my favourite alcoholic drinks, and I have quite a few, my... <laughs> Stephen Challenge. I just thought it was such a tedious way to begin a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably wrong of me. I begin just as tediously. Paul Merton, four seconds on vermouth starting now. So there I was, hanging by my fingertips on the edge of Niagara Falls, when suddenly a huge glass of vermouth... <laughs> Thank you.
Paul Merton, speaking as a whistle when gained the extra point. He's now equal with Jan Ravens in second place. Stephen Fry's in the lead, and Jan, it's your turn to begin. The subject is oracles. Can you tell us something about those in this game starting now? Oracles <laughs> are people to tell you what is going to happen in your life. The most famous, of course, was in Delphi, the Greek oracle called Pythia, who was addressed by the people of Greece. No, I haven't got a lisp. And she would tell them what was going to happen, what would they should do politically, and when they were in their huge program of colonization, she would give them advice on what to do next. She would give the uh, oh. advice. I can't think of the <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of give. Yes. Right, well, listen, Paul, 35 seconds, Oracle, starting now. The man who lived next door to me when I was seven years old was considered by the rest of the neighbourhood a bit of an oracle. He had these magic underpants that could predict the future. <laughs> so what he would do is he'd go round his house and he'd take out these pair of pants and he'd say, I see a big dark man in the corner. And it usually turned out to be a policeman, because we all knew what he was up to. <laughs> The people when they're sort of local characters, you tend to sort of like chivvy them along because you don't really want to get too involved. And I remember one court case he went to where he suddenly said to the judge, He said, Look, he said, I know exactly what's going to happen in the next five minutes. And the judge says, I know what's going to happen to you in the next ten years, you're going to prison. <laughs> and that's what, I don't know, I said judge twice, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, you challenge. Yeah, no, I just thought I'd time it after the punchline, Alex and Jeff. There was a couple of happens and a couple uh, yeah. of gives. And that's right. It was yes, brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Three seconds for Oracle. Oh. Three. Oh, Three well, seconds. Sorry. It's not it's fair, is it? God, really? So right. Spine. Well, give him a bonus point because he did get a lot of laughs and didn't even wait for them. <laughs> right. Three seconds with you, Stephen. Oracle starting now. One of the best known was the Cumaean Sybil, of course, who was Greek as well. And the... <laughs> so Stephen Fry got a point for speaking as the whistle went, and Paul, your turn to begin. The subject, temper. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Uh, there is a process in the course of metalwork that's called tempering, but unfortunately <laughs> I don't know what it is, because as I say, I got CSE ungraded. But I suppose it's also a phrase, or a word rather, because it's not really a, what I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Jan, uh, really. Oh, I sort of hesitation, I think. No, deviation, yeah. but I don't think he really no, hesitated. went a bit sort of blah. Well, I he can't help my impediment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so, Jan. I'm sorry, 45 seconds starting now. I suppose it's... Uh, Stephen Fry, Chan. Second, I suppose. He's, he's, you he's did say, I suppose. No. Yes. Mm. 44 seconds for you, uh, Stephen, on temper starting now. I used to have an incredibly short temper, as they're called, i.e. I lost it very fast. Why that should make it short? I've no idea. I've repeated short. Uh, I've repeated Jan short. Yes. A pair of shorts. Yes, two shorts. <laughs> Jan, 38 seconds for you on temper starting now. Some people are of a very sanguine temper, which means that they are very hopeful, optimistic, not pessimistic. And some people are very <laughs> aggressive. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Right. Some people. Can't some people, are. yes. Mm. Paul, you have it back. It's awfully difficult game. No. 30 seconds. Temper, Paul, starting now. I suppose. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I've got to get firmer opinions. <laughs> yeah, that is the third one. Yeah. Yeah. 29 seconds, Temper, Stephen, starting now. Tempered steel is something to which Paul made reference, or at least in that area he made some kind of allusion. I don't know what it means either. We're both perfectly ignorant on the idea of tempering metals of any kind. However, it's something to do with testing, because, of course, that's the origin of the word, isn't it? It's the same as temptation. It actually comes from the same source as that word that I've just mentioned, which is reasonably fascinating if you're in any way elucidated by that kind of nonsense. I'm beginning to drivel, which is a shame, because temper is the subject on the card, and I must refer to it at all times. Haven't done so much so far, but temper is also... <laughs> I don't you were dribbling, but you increased your lead at the end of that round, and you begin the next round. The subject is getting into hot water. That's a nice subject. Will you tell us something about it in this game, starting now? I was always getting into hot water with my Latin master at school until they sacked him, which is a shame, because I liked communal baths. <laughs> However, this is really something which uh, uh, Paul's made mention of the same kind of idea at his school. It's obviously a concurrent problem which we must be dealing with urgently. Uh, <laughs> uh, Paul Martin challenge. I'm sorry, I can't hear a word you say. <laughs> it's embarrassment, I'm afraid. Yeah. You've suddenly abandoned consonants like they never existed. 
He was speaking so quietly, I don't think he even heard himself what he was saying. Oh, Paul, you have 44 seconds to tell us something about getting into hot water starting now. You have to be very careful when you've filled your bath with hot water to make sure that it's not too hot for you to get into. A lot of people employ the elbow method where they... Stephen Fry, Chan. Nobody employs the elbow method. <laughs> I happen to know that. A lot of, some people employ the elbow method. I said elbow, didn't I? My mother is recording this. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I quite... think he was close enough to yeah. elbow, even if it wasn't yeah. exactly sounded he that way. He doesn't know his you. elbow from... Uh, no, that's... Any other <laughs> thing he won't this. go any further on the radio. Right, 34 seconds, getting into hot water. Paul, starting now. When you cook lobster, it's essential to get this particular unfortunate crustacean into lots of hot water. So you get hold of a water source. Stephen Fry Chan. Uh, get. Yes, you get. were getting uh, too much get. there. At least getting... you could hear every word. <laughs> <laughs> getting into hot Even water. Even if I can't you... pronounce them properly. <laughs> Stephen, getting into hot water, 25 seconds, starting now. I have a very sensitive skin and find it difficult to get into hot water without burning or scalding myself. Therefore, I take great pains to test the temperature of the bath fluid in order to maintain a decent 140 Fahrenheit degree heat. It is not necessary for it to be... Paul Merton Challenge. Isn't that way above boiling? <laughs> No. Did I? Did I? 140 degrees Fahrenheit. No, 180 yeah. Fahrenheit. Oh, is I said boiling. Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah. well, I took a wild chance there. Okay. <laughs> so it was incorrect, Charlie Stephen. Two seconds on getting into hot water, starting now. I should be getting into hot water, my mother, for pretending that she's recording this, because of course. <laughs> <laughs> So Stephen Fry was again speaking as the whistle went and has increased his lead at the end of the round. And Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. The subject is, what's in my fridge? Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? You mean your fridge or my fridge? <laughs> Peter, after 28 years, you know you can take the subject whichever way you like, my fridge or your fridge. Have what? an assignation, your place or mine. <laughs> <laughs> Then let's get back onto that, especially as Paul's vying for my attentions as well. Um, uh, vying? I didn't know there was a queue. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I'll never get out of this one. Right. There are 60 seconds, Peter. Take the subject whichever way you like. What's in my fridge starting now? Well, not very much, really, because I'm supposed to do some shopping in the morning, but there are some cubes of ice ready to make a dry martini. <laughs> Unfortunately, no gin or vodka. But I'm hoping, if I get home early enough, there will be about a quarter of a bottle of white wine if my wife hasn't drunk it. She's not recording this program, <laughs> never has, and doesn't. But there is a little pot of olive pate, there's some pesty sauce, there's a few <coughs> eggs. Jan Raven sounds. <coughs> Repetition of theirs. Theirs, theirs. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, Jan, well, listen, 34 seconds. What's in my fridge starting now? I have a photograph of my young baby son opening the door of my fridge and revealing what's inside it, and so I can remember very easily what is there. There's some pasta from Safeways, there's some basil, there's some cheese, and I'm repeating there's... Uh, Peter, well. you challenge. I'll challenge myself again. There. You know, there's, yeah, the same, way. The same word thing that you think. Yeah. Peter, there's again. Back with you. 20 seconds. What's in my fridge starting now? Well, we have an ice compartment and there are a few uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of ice. You had some ice right at the oh, beginning. that's right. Yes. yes, that's right. 18 seconds for you okay. to tell us something about what's in my fridge, Paul, starting now. Lord Lucan. <laughs> <laughs> We give Paul a bonus point for his remark because it was a, it was a classic one and he gets a bonus for that. And then he hesitated, waited for the laugh. I was right. I was riding the laugh. <laughs> yes. Riding the laugh? They went mad. <laughs> riding the laugh? You just decided to retire on the laugh. <laughs> a lot of people have retired on less, I can tell you. I know, I a will grant you that. should have done, Nicholas. <laughs> no. Yes. Well, that wasn't fair, Stephen. No, 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 I was just about to pay the compliment of saying it was a laugh worth retiring on uh, mm. Paul so but oh is he retiring <laughs> <laughs> yes Not so it no I know. Yeah, it seems to be it seems to we be very s busy <laughs> 
He was so good we thought he could retire. I was asked when I was going to retire the other day. And I Peter. said, I usually do just after news at ten. What? <laughs> <laughs> Give Peter a bonus point too. And five seconds on what's in my fridge, Peter, starting now. A lot of odd things that we have to use up fairly soon. They're beyond their sell-by or even edible date, I think. <laughs> Well, at the end of that round, Stephen Fry is still in the lead, only just ahead of Paul Merton and then Jan Ravens and Peter Jones in that order. And this is the last round coming up, and Jan, it's your turn to begin. And the subject, euphemisms. Will you tell us something about those in this game starting now? Euphemisms are what people use when they don't want to say what they really mean. So if, for example, people are dying, they might say... Uh, Stephen Fry challenge you. Uh, there were people, I don't There were people, I'm afraid, people Jan. People all yes. over the place. Mm. I know. 54 seconds, euphemisms with you, Stephen, starting now. It's a characteristic of the modern right-wing journalist to moan at euphemisms all the time, isn't it? And go on about how we have to have rodent operators instead of rat catchers and so on. I suppose they are rather irritating, because <coughs> I prefer people to say <coughs> I'm sitting on the bog, not... Something like, I'm on the unnecessary, or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, if I see a spade, I call it just that. And um, that's my uh, way, and I don't apologise for it. But, um, I suppose it's one of... Jan Raven sounds. Hesitation. Yes, I'm afraid so. He was so... He was riding the laugh, then, I think. So. <laughs> <clears throat> 28 seconds, euphemisms. Back with you, Jan, starting now. Actors use euphemisms a lot. When they go and see each other backstage, they are very wont to say, darling, you were marvellous, when really they thought they were crap, or, well, what about you? Or maybe, that was very brave, or something of that sort. Politicians use euphemisms. They are apt to uh, say... Stephen Fry challenge. Uh, a couple of uses in the... Yes, the uses, yes, the actors and politicians. Oh, sh- Stephen, you've got... Taskmaster Stephen. <laughs> Nine seconds to go oh, on yep. euphemisms, starting now. Jan calling me a hard... Hard taskmaster is a euphemism for meaning I'm a sodden old bastard, I think. <laughs> I'm reading of the situation, and she has every reason to use that sort of euphemism because I am just. <laughs> As I said a few seconds ago, that was to be the last round, and I will now give you the final score. Peter Jones, who has triumphed many times. He came in fourth place, but he was just behind Jan Ravens, who's only played the game once before. She was a few points behind Paul Merton, who's played it frequently. But Stephen Fry, who's played it a limited number of times, has once again excelled and got most points. So did we say he is the winner, Stephen Fry. We do hope you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only remains for me to say, on behalf of Stephen Fry, Paul Merton, Peter Jones and Jan Ravens, thank you very much. And also on behalf of Miriam Jones, uh, who has been keeping the score, blowing the whistle, our creator of the game, Ian Messiter, our producer, Sarah Smith, and myself, Nicholas Parsons. Hope you've enjoyed it, and you'll be with us when we once more play Just a Minute. Till then, from all of us, goodbye. (laughs) 